Thank you. And staff will be making a presentation. This is one in a series of presentation about the Sustainable Cities Initiative, its research projects um, that we worked with the University of Oregon's program on. And I'm not sure which staff is going to come. Julie Warnke is coming to the podium first. Good evening, Council President and members of the Council. My name is Julie Warnicke with the um, Public Works Department, Transportation Planning Manager. And I'm going to be one of three presenters tonight. We are talking about projects that were um, most closely involved with the Public Works Department, particularly transportation and stormwater. I want to start by emphasizing that there was a whole lot of student work that went into these projects, and so our summary will only be very high level, and we will definitely not get to the um, adequately portray all of the work that went into this. There will be and are already some of the student reports posted on the website. Uh, for example, I have one here that will be up on the website, I think, pretty soon. And so you can always go to those for more information. We ask that you hold um, questions unless they are you know, really clarifying questions until the end so that we can make sure that uh, we get through all of the five courses that we are attempting to <coughs> summarize this evening. So um, I'm going to be talking about the downtown parks connectivity. This was actually, um, it's consisted of two different courses, both out of the University of Oregon and both were taught by uh, Mark Schloss Schlossberg, who I believe is one of the directors of the Sustainable Cities Initiative program. We asked the students, um, and this is a, both a fall course and a spring course, but we asked them to look at the many parks and trails that we have in the downtown core of Salem and make suggestions on how we can enhance connections between them, particularly for people who are walking and bicycling, and also ways that we can market them and make them, I guess, more used. There's a number of people who probably work in Salem that don't even know about all the different little gems that we have hiding right around the downtown area. Between the two courses, where there were a total of 23 different student studies, and they can broadly be grouped into the categories that are listed on the slide. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, I will not be able to cover all of them. I'm going to try to provide examples in all of the categories, though. So to start with, in um, connectivity for pedestrians, and this is a little bit washed out here on the slide, but um, so on the left side here is, thank you, <laughs> I'm still a little washed out, but uh, on the left side is uh, was a web application tool that some students developed. And so to develop this, they had to work with GIS, Geographical Information Systems, to basically map in all of our sidewalks, some condition rating, all of the driveway cuts throughout downtown. And then this tool is something that could be used by the general public to chart a route from point A to point B, either using the most direct from a time standpoint route, and that I believe is shown in the purple color here, or using what would be considered, based on their program, the most accessible route, and so the one with the fewest obstacles, fewest driveway cuts, et cetera. That's, um, this tool is something that we are trying to obtain so that we can consider putting it up on the city website. We've had requests from a, a professor with Tokyo International University um, saying they thought that would be really useful to their students coming in from out of town. Another student took the approach of mapping different recreational routes throughout downtown that connect parks, and so the idea here was either from a walking or a you know, jogging perspective, um, trying to market what we have in Salem that people can go out and uh, enjoy on a daily basis, uh, maybe at lunch hour, et cetera.
On bicycle connectivity, we had um, a number of proposals that ranged in their uh, scale and complexity. The two s examples that I chose are uh, sort of two extremes. On the left here is a proposal for improving cross-city connections, and basically making a loop across around the Willamette River connecting our parks. So it would include adding um, a bicycle pedestrian um, access across the Willamette River to the north around Pine Street, adding another one to the south here that would connect over to Minto Brown Park, um, the bridge over the slough, and so you'd end up with the ability to do some sort of uh, figure eight, um, however, rather a costly proposal. <laughs> Very ambitious. Uh, on the right side here, you see a, a Photoshop uh, simulation of improving the connection for bicycles into and through Bush Park. So this is, if you're familiar with where Church Street um, joins Bush Park at the south side, there's a, currently a very narrow and in poor condition asphalt path that connects up to the bathrooms there that are at the top of the Soapbox Derby. And so this proposal would take and widen that, make it so that it can be used by more than one travel mode comfortably. And then also they proposed connections um, up to Church Street and Winter Street on the north side of the park. The students were very excited about looking for opportunities to um, attract um, people to Salem um, for various you know, active living, uh, connecting people to the parks and the city. There was a proposal for a Bike Salem event, which would be modeled, could be modeled after um, similar events, car-free events that make use of both parks and street right-of-way for, um, I guess, a celebration. And there are similar events that have been scheduled and taken place around the world. Another student who was graduating from the University of Oregon and had run marathons before chose to chart out a possible marathon route. Uh, initially, he looked at keeping it all within um, our parks, particularly Wallace Marine Park and Minto Brown. However, he determined that really wasn't, wasn't really feasible without having to double over certain sections. And so he proposed this route, which is more extensive and also connects to more parks, along with various first aid stations. Um, unless you want to make this into uh, having some swimming involved, you would need to have the bridge over the um, Willamette Slough there. One group of students uh, worked on some tools for engaging the community in planning. They developed a, this mobile GIS tool where you would be able to give uh, citizens a, a, some sort of computer device that they could go out and collect, both collect data for, that would help the city in terms of condition rating. So some very, you could design it with some very factual questions and then also with perception questions. And so by doing that, you're um, gathering data and then also getting people to really think about the system and what works and what doesn't work for them. This is just an example of um, uh, pulling out uh, from that data the areas where they determined there to be an unacceptable you know, surface condition. And this, this was the area they focused on just because it was pretty data in intensive. It would be sort of fun to have some tool like this that you could work with neighborhood associations on um, throughout the city. What's the green block in the middle? Um, I believe the green block there is Willamette University. They were um, sort of using that as the center point um, of their scope. And then um, looking at ways to encourage bicycling, uh, we had a number of different proposals, including um, <coughs> students who created a logo that could be used for uh, encouraging bicycling in Salem here. Um, they, they developed different flyers, pamphlets for different events that they recommended the city um, consider doing, working with different uh, advocacy groups.
so to sum up, their key recommendations were uh, first to, to make use of new tools that are out there um, for uh, engaging c citizens and for transportation planning. Uh, I guess that's probably not surprising given that one of these courses was a GIS course and it was a pretty intermediate advanced level course. So these students were inclined towards technology. Um, looking at the you know, the corridors, the connections between places. So trying to get away, get away from, not sure they were saying we were there, but make sure that if we're doing a spot improvement somewhere, it really is part of a larger whole route. Uh, they encouraged the building partnerships. Um, the city, we currently work with a number of volunteer groups and I think they wanted to see that expand. Um, and then just like I said earlier, marketing and um, doing a lot of more coordinating on the bicycle side. So from here, um, the timing of this was actually really um, very nice because we are working on an update of the, our bicycle and pedestrian elements of the Salem Transportation System Plan through a process called Bike and Walk Salem. That's a, uh, it's a grant funded process, but with the student studies going on simultaneously, uh, our consultants were able to view what was being presented. We as staff and, and various committee members got to see what the students were thinking about and see how we could incorporate those into updates to the Transportation System Plan that will be coming um, to council later this year. We will continue to work with um, partnerships in the community. Um, some of you might have heard in the past of the Mid Willamette Valley Area, Com no, sorry, wrong acronym, the M Mid Willamette Valley Bicycle Transportation Alliance. Uh, that group has actually reformed recently with a new name. Um, the uh, Bicycle Transportation Alliance out of Portland has decided to not extend statewide anymore. And so the local advocates have formed a group called Ask for Bikes. And then finally, uh, we will continue to pursue funding for different tools and projects that were recommended, including seeking grant opportunities where we can find them. So next up will be Kevin Hotman talking about transportation safety. Excuse me. Uh, good evening, counselors. My name is Kevin Hotman. I'm the city traffic engineer. And I was involved with uh, two student groups out of uh, Portland State University. Both were engineering groups. There was approximately 100 students that uh, were involved in the projects that I'll be talking about. Generally, they were kind of grouped into uh, two different study areas. One focused more on uh, vehicle issues and the other uh, more on bike and ped pedestrian issues. Um, the first group I'll talk about, it was the group that was focused on the, the, the vehicle issues. And they uh, looked at four topics, uh, traffic safety, uh, traffic operations, um, safety at schools, routes to schools, and bicycle and pedestrian safety. A small, just a small portion of that. Um, some examples of what they did, I, I'm gonna, like Julie, just focus on a few of the, uh, the topics. They, they, there was a, a lot of things they, they studied, but I wanted to kind of give you an example of, of, of some of the projects they worked on. Uh, at, at Judson Middle School, they looked at the safe routes to school and the, the issues that face Judson Middle School are the students as they enter or exit the school through the front door. Uh, they have to cross the parking lot and many of them also have to cross Jones Road to access their um, uh, pick up and drop off areas. So. Um, there are difficulties with how the students go and what they did was, <coughs> excuse me, what they did first was look at the routes that the students took so they could try to address the main um, uh, the concentration of students. And the, the red arrows, the red lines kind of show how they, they broke up. And, um, and then from that point, then they, they came up with uh, some 
ideas and recommendations for that. And this kind of slide shows those some of those recommendations, which were to better mark the routes that the students take. Uh, they included doing a small curb extension right now where um, vehicles park uh, to provide a, a defined crossing access. And then they also did the same thing in the parking lot here and uh, did some other uh, markings to improve some of the access to the sides areas. So um, that was a, a good project that they did. Um, another one that involved traffic safety, uh, they looked at a high accident location, which was uh, Lancaster at Sunny, Sunny View. And uh, this is kind of the intersection. And um, they did a lot of observations out, out in the field to um, look at it as a high accident location. There, there's a lot of traffic. And um, so their, their objective was to try to figure out some ways to to reduce accidents and crashes there, and what they what they observed was that there are a lot of a um, lot of things going on in the intersection, a lot of bicycle, pedestrian, buses, and some of the things they looked at were trying to remove the buses from the through lanes as they were operating. Um, boarding or, or deboarding passengers. They looked at the signing out there, see if there was a way to make it less confusing. And then they also looked at bike ped access and, and circulation and uh, talked about some of the, the issues on behavior, not only for drivers, how they were behaving as they were making movements, but also bike and ped congestion and some of the things that were happening there. Kevin, could you move your microphone just a little closer? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the other group that I worked with um, focused more on bicycle and pedestrian traffic circulation. And they, they looked at um, safety operations and then route connectivity and improvements to, to routes. One example of, the, of what they looked at in terms of bicycle operations was the uh, bike route, the bike lanes on Commercial Street. Uh, there is a full bike lane uh, from downtown all the way down uh, to South Commercial, uh, down to the courthouse area. Uh, there is one area that is disconnected at um, where Liberty Road splits off and goes south. Um, Ross is right here. Um, as a bicyclist, you it, you can't. It's very difficult to make that north-south connection because there's a double turn onto Liberty Road, and it is, it is very difficult to merge into traffic and try to get through that. Um, this was one of the the Bicycle Alliance Transportation Bike Transportation Alliance um, areas of concern, and uh, what they proposed to do was to route the bicyclists on South Commercial onto Liberty to Vista, which is just on the north side of the Ross parking lot, and then uh, create either widen the sidewalk or create a bike lane and, and uh, route them over using Vista, using the traffic signals there. And that would be a, a safer, though a little less direct route, but it would provide a safe connection. So, so that was kind of their proposal. Another uh, project that was looked at was connectivity, and this one focused on West Salem. Uh, Union Street Bridge uh, connects down to uh, Wallace Road, um, and the only way to really cross Wallace Road is to go up to, uh, to Taggart or um, to Edgewater. And so they were looking for a way to improve uh, connections across Wallace Road and then connecting to the Edgewater Trail, which heads out towards Dallas. So their proposal was to, um, to construct a bridge. Uh, the grades towards the, the Union Street Bridge would allow an easy connection to a bridge. And to bring a, a bridge down, uh, they proposed connecting to Bassett. Um, and then looping around, that would leave this large parcel to redevelop in the future. <clears throat> So their, their proposal was to make this connection around and, and provide a safer uh, 
access for bikes and pedestrians to the West Salem area. Uh, the next steps um, that we would look at taking, uh, all traffic issues um, we, we present to the Citizen Advisory Traffic Commission and we would take um, the issues that were presented by the groups and, and present those to, to that uh, Citizen Advisory Traffic Commission. And then um, selected recommendations, the ones that seemed like they wouldn't be too expensive or could be done, um, then we would maybe move forward with additional detail and, uh, and some of those could um, we consider adopting into the transportation system plan. So that was, that's kind of in a nutshell what, uh, what that group did. Next up is, is Robert Chandler, and he'll talk about stormwater. Good afternoon, counselors. I'm Robert Chandler, the Assistant Director of Public Works, and it is my pleasure to uh, present to you the highlights of the results we got from the Sustainable uh, Cities Initiative looking at stormwater management options. And it was great fun to work with three highly talented students from the Western Environmental Law Student, uh, Law Center, rather. Um, what we asked them to do is select stormwater facilities that uh, fall in the category low impact development uh, or green stormwater infrastructure, take those through our current regulations and permit and pro permitting processes, look for any barriers that might exist for constructing these facilities, and then look at options that we might engage uh, to encourage the installation or additional incorporation of these facilities on public and private property. They looked at four different types of facilities. They looked at dis, uh, downspout disconnections, uh, which of course are highly dependent on the nature of the underlying soils, green roofs, uh, permeable paving, and then rain gardens. What they did is they uh, selected these four sites and they went through the whole regulation and permitting practices. Um, uh, they uh, identified several areas that we could do better regarding incorporating these practices and then uh, evaluated options for encouraging this, uh, these installations, looking at uh, practices from other cities, including Portland and uh, a few other cities. Among the key recommendations, uh, our current storm, uh, Salem Revised Code does not actually allow permeable paving in the public right-of-way. Uh, we need to evaluate our code and revise it to allow stormwater facilities. Um, it's currently allowed by our code only in areas zoned for commercial and, and, commercial and industrial areas, uh, which makes a residential rain garden problematic. And then to look at uh, opportunities for additional outreach and tools, they came with some various ideas for that. And uh, where we go from here, we are currently working at the staff level to uh, create a new stormwater code to, uh, we are updating our design standards to incorporate uh, criteria and design standards and, and uh, maintenance requirements for our uh, stormwater facilities. Uh, actually, a very nice, the timely work for this is that both of these fit very nicely into our municipal stormwater code issued by the Department of Environmental Quality, which requires us to evaluate our codes for any barriers to these low impact development techniques, as well as to revise our design standards and codes. Uh, they looked at incentives and coming up, as you well know, our municipal stormwater utility comes up and that incorporates provisions for credits, reductions of these rates, uh, depending on the nature and the performance of the stormwater facility you have on your site. And we are currently in the process of looking at revising our municipal codes to make sure we remove these barriers as appropriate. And with that, subject to your questions, that concludes our uh, presentation. And all three of us are now open for any questions you might have. I have a question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, much. Uh, two questions, one relating to park interconnectivity, <clears throat> and then the second one on the uh, stormwater stuff. So I can start with stormwater, since you're standing there. Got it. Um, currently, the way it was proposed, the stormwater uh, utility would not have credits for residential properties. That is correct. We mentioned residential stormwater facilities. Would that then potentially open up that door to where people who are managing their stormwater runoff and have none can actually get that $3 or, or whatever else off? Or is it still too expensive to uh, put a new system inside of that? manage 
we're going to stick with the recommendation that we presented to council last December, which is the stormwater rate credit reductions would not be uh, available to residential rate payers at, the, at this time. Uh, the intent is that the residential rate is relatively low and the cost to administer such a rate credit program for 35,000 or so residential rate payers is not an effective use of those rate monies. So at the moment, the intent is the rate credits would only be available to non-residential rate payers. You're, you're correct on that. Okay, I would just like to say that if it's anything like what we have to do with the, uh, the water and sewer, that that small number will double and possibly triple over the next decade uh, as they inflict more things upon us to where it may be um, actually advantageous to folks to not have that extra portion of their bill. Okay. So, thanks. If I hang around, I'll keep pushing it. Um, okay. In uh, the park connectivity, we had the uh, Parks Master Plan Committee met last week, and there was talk of either an SDC or some other piece of the program to deal with park inter connectivity trails or what have you. And I asked the question is, are there miracle properties that we haven't known of that we could put a trail through or, or is it specifically to try to use the streets and sidewalks and, and you know, bike lanes are already there to lead people to a new park. And so that's kind of sounded like what you were suggesting to try to just enhance those connections that already exist between sidewalks and bike lanes and maybe sign them better to say, here, you're going to this park now? What, we didn't really limit the students on, um, you know, with that respect, so they could propose any, you know, any crazy ideas that they might have. I mean, not crazy, but um, imaginative. Um, so, but are there empty properties then that they actually found paths that you know? I, I'm to? not in the top of my head. I'm not thinking of any empty properties that they found. However, um, for example, I know that you know in the parks master plan today, and I believe even in the transportation system plan, there is a um, identified a um, desire to have a trail at some point along Mill Creek um, in North Salem, where there are not available properties. I mean. You know, I'm not exactly sure. The planning has not been done to that level of detail. And so I don't recall any of the students coming up with specific locations um, for new trails. Okay, and I, I just, it sounded like as part of what they were doing, they were looking for the, that connectivity between them. I think that the they were, on yeah. Parcels or, or ways to get from one to the other that I don't know of. What I saw more from them was more enhancing what we have. Um, in terms of connections. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Councillor Clem. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bennett. Um, not sure who wants to answer this, Dr. Chandler maybe, but specifically um, two issues that I saved through all the slides were uh, these. Uh, number one, uh, were there any fiscal constraints um, given to the students at all, i.e. a bridge crossing over Wallace a state highway is going to cost two million dollars just to get bikes across and ODOT will probably disapprove it anyway. So were there any constraints or was this sort of free flow, free thinking sort of what are the needs? The answer was we did not constrain the students in their imagination by a dollar amount. Okay. And given that's the answer, I'm concerned about w one comment that I heard that these recommendations were going to be incorporated into the Salem Transportation Plan. Um, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that the students recommended this. What I would be disappointed to see is that those actually turn into hard recommendations without full vetting of, of uh, some of our subcommittees and the council. Um, Yes, anything that the students were recommending, they would just be considered as part of the bike and walk sale and plan. They would not automatically be assumed in there. Um, I will say that there are some things that are in being recommended in the bike and walk sale and plan that are expensive. And then there's some things that are less expensive. And so that will come to council, planning commission and council. We have our, um, we have an advisory committee meeting actually tomorrow evening at 6.30 at Pringle Hall where we are talking about the preferred bicycle concept. Um, I, it, I do believe though that it does right now include an overcrossing of um, Wallace Road at that location. So mm -hmm. just to uh, let you know, but it, uh, not just because a student suggested it. 
Yeah, okay, and I, I'd be very concerned to see that. Is that coming to the Streets and Bridges uh, subcommittee m meeting? Um, seeing how that's, bond. the bond is what the voters voted for. I'm not sure they voted for that crossing. So help me understand the fund source. The um, funding for the Bike and Walk Salem plan is um, actually a grant fund from ODOT, um, Transportation and Growth Management Program, and so it's really not related to the bond measure, and so it's a long-range planning project, so I guess I would not assume that it would go to the bond committee because it's not oh, okay. looking at, yeah. this is looking longer term, so what, beyond what has already been, the voters have already said that they want to fund, what type of needs, do we have and do we want to prioritize as a community? Sure, but it's a TGM grant for planning only. It, it's yes, not it's a design. Correct. No, it's not design. Right. Thank you. And if I could, before we would go through the process of identifying funding for any projects in these plans, it would be through your normal council process and looking at the capital improvement program. So we're a ways away from that. So some of these, you know, in all of our plans, we have some aspirational goals as well, so, but there will be a process that we'll go through to identify which ones stay in and which ones don't. Councilor Clausen. Two quick questions about the stormwater. Um, one, I saw the mention of the permeable pavement. Do any communities permit that right now in public applications, roads? The answer is I'm sure there are. I couldn't tell you which ones they, that, uh, which ones but they are allowed by a certain jurisdictions. Some have actually been installed for quite some time mm. with varying degrees of success. I, that's what I was curious about, just to see if they are successful or not. I put some of that in. It's interesting to watch, but I just wonder what it'd look like after cars drive on it for five years. It, it actually varies in large measure by the degree of maintenance, the types of yeah. traffic, or actually whether it was installed properly to begin with. Sure. A lot of variables in, which is why drawing clear conclusions it's can tough. be difficult. Got it. And then the other question, uh, Along the lines, Councillor Nanke asked about the residential uh, credit for the stormwater. Has there been any discussion about residential credit for development at the development level? So, you know, a developer comes in and proposes, uh, I want to do 20 acres and I'm going to put a rain garden in and it's going to be all stormwater treated on site. That type of thing, would is that a potential in what we have coming forward or maybe you, you in the mean future? A, a, each of the individual residential properties would have some kind of facility on site? Well, some sort it, of. Or a, res, or a regional facility or a subdivision scale facility. Maybe a subdivision scale, scale facility. And I think the idea is just that uh, if we have a code coming in place where it's going to be that separated out fee and people aren't using it, are we going to provide that incentive for developers to get there? Uh, it's a great tool for us to be able to maybe look that way. And I'm, I realize it might not be happening now, but is it a feasibility? We might be able to move that direction? We can certainly look toward that. Again, the, the main issue is uh, given our current funds and our, address, our, our, our level of ambition, the um, uh, addressing the roughly 2,500, 3,000 non-residential rate payers and their credits is much more feasible than the 30,000, 35,000 residential rate payers and giving them credit. Right, understood. And I'm just thinking, you know, if you get a development of 400 properties coming in and it's one piece of exception, say. Where that just thinking out fit, loud. Excuse me. I'm just thinking out loud, that's all. Where that does fit to some degree is um, as we're developing the municipal stormwater code, that has requirements for both flow control and treatment um, that would be on the subdivision scale. But if they incorporate on-site residential facilities that reduce the flows and reduce the need for treatment, then you have a smaller facility that, treats, that addresses the entire subdivision, smaller facility, less cost. So there is a credit, an incentive during the course of construction. Okay. At the development stage. At development stage, that's correct. correct. Thanks. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, following off Councilor Clem's line of thought, I know that there's been two different means sometimes of things coming through council. Uh, they come to council and we say, yeah, planning commission, go ahead and have public hearing, bring it back to council. Will we mm -hmm. see this before it moves down? Or are we gonna be uh, the last to know as the, uh, the updates to those plans? Uh, for the stormwater plans? No, for the, uh, well, for any in, of in the upgrades suggested uh, by the SCI project throughout uh, more specifically through the transportation system plan mm -hmm. and uh, the bike walk Salem piece. Will that come to us to send to the planning commission or will it just go to them? 
Julie, can you talk about what the process is? Um, yes, the, the Bike and Walk Salem um, project, I guess, is being, like I said, is funded by a grant. And so um, staff requested approval for applying for that grant, you know, originally, which was essentially council's um, endorsement of the process to update our bicycle pedestrian plan. Now, obviously, um, we are developing a lot of material and a lot of recommendations. Our proposal is to do a joint work session with council and planning commission. Um, right now, I believe we have it scheduled for October 24th. Um, and then that will then go from there to planning commission for the first hearing. So it will not be action by the council to send it to planning commission, but um, it would then go through Planning Commission and then come to you as a future report and then tentatively public hearing December 12th, but of course that's assuming everything lines up and continues to flow. Okay, excellent. And the October 24th is the date. Okay, yes. and okay. that's for the bike walk. What about the, uh, the transportation? The Bike Walk Salem is just the short name for the update of the transportation system plan. Okay. It just got really long. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Councillor Klein. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Julie, um, the, um, the, the need to meet urban standards with separate bike and pedestrian facilities is a fascinating one. Um, I work uh, with a lot of municipalities, cities mostly, and they've gone to multi-use paths so that you aren't building two facilities um, you're building a wider one, maybe with more right-of-way need, but in a sense, less right-of-way need and lower costs. Um, is, there, is there really any sort of a push for, in any of this bike walk stuff, because council worries about policy, is there any mindset to eliminating the need for both bike lanes and walking paths and going to what a number of other jurisdictions are using in terms of multi-use? Paths. There has been um, some discussion about where we can use different facilities other than sort of the standard sidewalk and bike lane. Um, one example that we have right now in our plans is actually along Marine Drive, the future Marine Drive in West Salem, where the east side of that future street is um, adjacent to um, farmland that won't have many access ways. And so we are proposing there not to have bike lanes on the street and instead to have a wide, I believe it's a 12 foot wide um, shared use path on the east side of the street there. Uh, we have, um, our consultants have suggested a number of other location, possible locations for shared use paths, um, potentially along Kubler um, east of I-5. Um, we, so we are looking at it. There are considerations and issues with when you have a shared use path, you have um, traffic going in two directions. And so the number of driveways, you create sort of safety issues. Um, and then I guess the other issue that we're trying to, str we're struggling with a bit is when development comes along, they want to know what is the cross section that we need to build along our frontage. Well, if your frontage is, you know, 500 feet long, we're not really going to be able to say, okay, build a multi-use path for 500 feet, and then, and you know, until we get money to do the rest of it, everybody has to sort of run across the street, you know, to go the other direction. So we, we are struggling with a little bit of that in terms of how you would phase that. So, yeah, I, I think um, I appreciate that, but right now, I can point to numerous instances where we've got sidewalk and no sidewalk. We have a bike lane, no sidewalk, and we have sidewalk, no bike lane. Eola Drive is an example of that. So I would, I would, I would really encourage staff to take a look at um, what other cities are doing because they're making it work. That driveway has got to go now through a sidewalk and a bike lane to get to the street. It would make sense to me that if visibility issues weren't a problem, that in fact it would be safer to have only one lane one sort of facility that the backing out car or the in entering car would have to negotiate cross traffic on so um, 
Yes, and we are looking at different approaches, what other jurisdictions do. Some of the level of detail in terms of, you know, choosing a specific street. Okay, this is what we want to do on that specific street. Some of that would have to come really with a city-funded project that's being developed and designed for that street, since every, every street is a little bit different. And that's why I'm dropping the name Eola Drive that you're designing <laughs> right now. It would really be smart if you take a look at that. Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One thing probably other jurisdictions aren't doing is painting a person in with the bike on the Sharrows. Um, so we probably could get away without having people out in the street as well as bikes and cars. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in one of the slides, it, it had a, a suggestion to remove the bike lanes from Lancaster. Is, is that in along a similar line to connect them with the sidewalks or just to get all bikes off of Lancaster altogether? Well, I think that group was looking at uh, vehicle congestion and, and safety at an intersection. So uh, they were seeing a lot of um, poor behavior from all of the different users and um, that the bike lanes were kind of a conflict with the, with the auto. I think they were really focused on auto traffic only. And that's why they were looking at the buses moving and, and things. So um, I don't think that's an idea that we really want to move forward it with. But it was just strange. showing some of the ideas that the students were, were looking at and considering. OK, thanks. Uh, Julie, I had uh, one question. Uh, over the past year or so, a group of citizens had put together a proposal for a pathway, a, co a connection, I guess, uh, between Bush Park essentially moving down to Riverfront P Park, uh, going along the blind school. Are you familiar with that? Did that get a look by these students? I do not believe any of the students really focused on that. Okay. <clears throat> I, I know that it's something that we've um, you know, looked at having a connection for bicycling and walking through there just as part of Bike and Walk Salem, but um, I do not believe any of the students focused on that. One of the reasons I ask is, uh, given the kinds of costs associated with some of the ideas, this one really involves signs more than anything, just putting up some signing that indicated if you want to find your way from Bush Park on a, uh, a reasonably uh, uh, pleasant route uh, without conflict with cars or bicycles, uh, you could follow this pathway. And I just wondered, uh, I thought that was kind of an elegant solution that merely involved signing, or appeared to, maybe a little right away from the, uh, the state or the hospital along the old blind school property. And um, that is one of the things that we're looking at for downtown wayfinding, I believe, as part of that project. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, if I could, one comment real quick. Um, I don't know what our process is for thanking the students for all their great work. I know there's been a couple of thank you ceremonies and stuff, but it really is great for these students to take an interest in, uh, in Salem. And so I hope that we're responding either as a council or from your office, Linda, uh, in, in letting them know that we really do want to try to, to use the ideas that have been presented as best we can. Great. Thank you. It's, it's been, as they've said, uh, just a tremendous learning opportunity for them to be able to work on real projects in a city. And we feel that we've been able to get a lot of research assistance that we would not have had staff time for otherwise. And so it's been very beneficial. We have one more of these updates, I believe, coming to council. And after that, it might be a good I think maybe just to have a letter from the city council to them. I know they would, they and the professors would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll adjourn the work session. We'll reconvene council at 6 30. And sitting in for her tonight is guest counselor Angela Delk.
Councillor Cannon? Yes. Councillor Clem? Here. And Mayor Peterson is absent. Great, thank you. And uh, guest Councillor Delk, uh, welcome. And certainly feel free to ask any questions you have throughout the meeting. Uh, we'll look forward to any thoughts you have on the issues in front of us this evening. Um, we have no report. Oh, I'm join me in the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we have no reports from boards or commissions or committees or presentations by outside agencies. Do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Is there anyone who hasn't signed up that would like to address the council on what? On, on matters on the agenda this evening? Are you raising your hand? No, I'm just waving. Just waving, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. All right, uh, Councillor Nanke, the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the consent calendar with additions and with the following pull. Seven, or just a second, let me get to where I am here. Uh, 4-3-C by Councillor Namke. Very second. Good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Our special order business, uh, item 4.3-C. Motion carry. Okay. Now we'll move on to 4.3C. Councillor Nanke. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move that uh, Salem City Council uh, take the funds that don't seem to be uh, wanted by the public and uh, reimburse them to the uh, Department of Energy. Second. Okay. Councillor um, Nanke's motion. And there's Tesler second questions as well of staff. <clears throat> we put this money into a loan program, nobody wants it, so now we want to take the money and use it for Riverfront Park. Is that essentially the, uh, the gist? It, um, Mr. Bechtel is in the uh, Mr. Bechtel just okay. went upstairs, okay. uh, but that, that I don't know the loan part, Councillor, but the, the plan is that, yeah, the money would be used then to retrofit the lighting at Riverfront Park. The the project overall, the project uh, for this grant was for energy efficiency programs. Some were for energy efficiency related to uh, the private sector and then some for uh, the public sector and for city facilities. So we've done things like uh, improve the lighting in this building as well, as well as other city buildings and um, done other energy efficient programs for the city that are reducing electricity costs. So uh, we st established this loan program for members of the public to see if anyone was interested, but they've had difficulty um, being able to um, work through the agreement conditions that exist. And rather than um, continue to have that money sitting there available, decided that it maybe would make more sense to use it in a way that further reduce electric costs for the for the city and for our taxpayers. And so there's some energy savings and some annual cost reductions from making these upgrades to the lights in, in the parks. Uh, and that's what this recommendation is. The, uh, the conditions that are onerous, are those based on the fact that it's ERA funding? No, I believe it has to do with uh, other banking criteria. And I don't know, I'm sorry, Mr. Bechtel or, or Mr. Wells, do you have that information? <laughs> John Wales from Urban Development. Uh, what this was, uh, the money that was put into the loan program was to buy down the interest rate. And so the, the, uh, the, uh, the city entered into an agreement with um, West Coast Bank to offer loans where we would um, use the, the, the uh, offer the loan money that to, to offer it at a lower interest rate. And it was really targeted for small, small um, commercial business lighting programs. And the truth is we didn't have any many applicants. Um, this is a market that uh, PGE had not yet moved into and that um, 
uh, and some of the other energy efficiency um, entities out there offering programs hadn't moved into. They've been large commercial loans, but not really small uh, commercial loans. This was a pilot study. I think it, it's, it's indicating that there isn't a, a market at this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just final comment on that. It, design for energy efficiency. Um, I think everybody knows my position on the entirety of it as far as being able to use that money to actually increase employment, uh, preferably through the private sector since they create things which will then pay more money into a, a governmental uh, realm. And so from a uh, financial efficiency perspective, knowing that we're borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar uh, that came from that, uh, I would suggest they seem to be having some money problems. Um, and we could give it back to them. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nanke. Uh, any further comment, Councillor Clem? Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Um, any idea, um, Linda or, or John, if we return the money that it will, any idea what will happen to it? Will it actually create less debt for the federal government or just go to another city? Annie Gorski, I'm a project manager in the Urban Development Department. Um, that uh, to be to answer your que question, Councillor Clem, um, that hasn't been a question that we've raised um, with the Department of Energy. Um, and based on what I've seen with other um, cities that have returned grants, those have gone back into a pool and have been distributed. I I, I don't know if that's the case with this. So. We, it, it, yeah. last question, if we do nothing at all, the money goes back anyway. Um, and so the point is we have until 31 August to decide um, what to do with June the money 31st. Of, of next of year. 2012, correct. Well, I should, I should back up. That is when um, the Department of Energy is asking that all funds be expended. Okay, so we don't have to decide on this tonight then. That is correct. Okay. Um, the target tonight was aimed at having enough time to um, be able to design another project, um, have the bidding process complete, and then be able to complete that project in time for June of next year. And the amount of money that this will save a year is the, in the staff report. It's the energy savings, yes, it's on page three of four in your staff report, item number four. And the energy savings are approximately 2,100 in electricity consumption. But right now we have to replace our bulbs once every three years in the park. And going to these uh, more efficient LED bulbs, we'll only have to replace them um, once every approximately 18 years instead of three years. And so there are also some maintenance savings as well as, um, you know, electric consumption savings. Any further comment, question? Councillor Nanke. Knowing that some of the initial LED products had lifetime issues, um, do we know that it'll actually be maintenance free for 18 years since no one's run one for 18 years? I think I could ask staff to come up. Um, was there, um, are there staff from facilities here this evening? No, okay. Um, we have been working with um, both through the Us University of Oregon Sustainable Cities Initiative. There were some recommendations, there was some research done by the students and recommendations related to LEDs and they were recommending um, to move forward with a variety of LED technologies. Um, and for this project, um, facilities has been working with Energy Trust of Oregon and um, various manufacturers. So we don't know, we think now is a, is a good time um, with the technology, but we do understand that the technology is changing. Any further questions, comments? Everyone understands the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. okay I, I'm going to have to have you raise your hands. The ayes raise your hands. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. It's a majority of the quorum. That was unexpected. <laughs> a victory. Thank you. A victory, okay, Councilor. <laughs> okay. Uh, move on to unfinished business. We have no unfinished business. Information reports. Any questions on information reports? 
chair has a motion on the added item 7D. Chair moves the city council reschedule the first reading of ordinance bill number 22-11 for August 8th, 2011 and schedule a public hearing on August 22nd, uh, 2011 to discuss uh, ordinance bill 2211. Second. Uh, this just as uh, just for information, this is the um, uh, uh, bank drive-through issue in the downtown historic district. Uh, do you want to comment on this, Vicki? Kind of take us through this. Sure, Vicki Harden Woods, your community development director. Um, what you have before you is a uh, ordinance bill that you had at your last meeting. At that meeting, you asked us to go back and look at some alternatives, particularly making it a variable standard. Um, we did take a look at that, but our sense was that would not achieve where the council wanted to go, which was to make this a very narrow application of this code. And so we came back to you with a recommendation that you schedule it for hearing and uh, make in consideration whether you want to approve it as proposed as a conditional use permit or not. Thank you. Any any questions? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, public hearings. We have uh, one public hearing this evening. Yes. Mm. Oh, this. Mm. Excuse me, we have um, a staff report. We do we have a staff report. Mr. Gross will be giving one. We just need a few minutes to gear up here. You moved rather quickly this evening. We're, we're not waiting for nobody. It's <laughs> <laughs> a PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could I first have Kathy introduce the, uh, the ordinance? The Salem City Council will now hold a public hearing to receive testimony regarding Ordinance Bill Number 20-11 <coughs> relating to the Neighborhood Center Mixed Use Zone and the Neighborhood Center Mixed Use Master Plans Chapter, amending SRC 113.110 and SRC 300.100. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Are you first? Uh, I think we're just about ready here. I am uh, Glenn Gross. I'm the planning administrator for the city of Salem, and uh, it's my honor to make this presentation tonight. I may have to do it without the benefit of slides. Pressure <laughs> <laughs> from above. Those light hand puppets can be pretty effective. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we're getting it. Okay, good. Um, this presentation is about why the neighborhood center mixed use or, or NCMU zone uh, was developed, the process that was used to bring this forward, and um, Finally, we'll give you an overview of the proposal as recommended by the Planning Commission. And it is uh, an ordinance bill that is recommended by the Planning Commission after uh, a long process, a long thoughtful process um, on, the, on their part and on the part of the public that participated in this. The hearing tonight is not about applying this new zone to a specific property but rather it's just about whether or not this new zone should be adopted and made part of the Salem zoning ordinance. Um, if adopted, it would be another option for developers to consider um, along with the other existing tools that we have. Uh, I'll speak more to this uh, in just a moment. Many of us live in a traditional single family detached housing subdivision, one house on one lot, um, surrounded by houses of similar size with um, no commercial services nearby. This uh, proposal before you tonight would be an alternative to that. Imagine, if you will, living in one of several small cottages mixed with some row houses situated around a green uh, common area. A pathway meanders along a, a pedestrian greenway next to a water course. And that connects the open area to a building containing several shops 
offering goods and services. Uh, the commercial area is access to the public street system by a way of a, a road with wide sidewalks and bike paths. A resident can walk from their front door along a nature trail to a cafe where they and their neighbors can meet and catch up with one another. Um, a neighbor of the development can either drive, bike, or drive, or, or walk from their home to take advantage of these nearby services. The design of the commercial area encourages people to connect with one another and thus strengthens the neighborhood. The proposed zone should be considered in the context of two facts. Our demographics are changing and a large portion of our population is aging. This means that some people will be looking for alternative housing choices in the future. This might include a mix of smaller homes and row houses surrounded by common open space and within walking distance of uh, commercial services. This, uh, this would be an alternative to caring for a large home and a large yard and having to drive everywhere for your daily needs. The proposal tonight responds to this by allowing different housing types, including multifamily over commercial areas, uh, requiring open space, requiring walkways, and allowing shops and offices in close proximity to residences. By encouraging a mix of uses and a variety of housing types, the NCMU will provide an opportunity to create a unique lifestyle choice for our changing and aging population. Think back for a moment to 2004 to 2006, that, that time frame. Uh, we were seeing a tremendous single family housing market boom. Uh, this was particularly true in West Salem. And we were processing, and the planning uh, staff was processing dozens of subdivision applications. Um, people living in these new developments, uh, and they're nice developments, but people living there have few choices uh, to obtain services. They either drive down to Wallace or, or the Edgewater Road area, or they drive across the bridge. The West Salem Neighborhood Plan, which was completed in 2003, did identify a major growth issue for the area, and that was the rapidly changing landscape uh, because of residential growth uh, was not being accompanied by a proportionate increase in services and jobs. And the neighborhood plan called for the development of a mixed use center that would provide for a coordinated development of a mix of uses, including residential, neighborhood retail, and other commercial services, along with public space and perhaps some civic uses. Using the neighborhood plan as a guide, we set out in 2006 to seek a willing property owner that might be interested in working with us to develop and apply a new zone uh, uh, that would be a mixed use zone to their property. We contacted several major property owners in the vicinity of Orchard Heights Road and Dokes Ferry Road because this general area was identified in the neighborhood plan as a, as a general area suitable for a future mixed use center. After several months of talking to various property owners, one property owner, the, the owner of the, what's known as the Bone Estate, uh, came forward and said that they would be willing to work with us to see if this would be something that would work for their property. In the spring of 2008, we initiated the project. Um, we worked with a planning consultant to confirm a, a number of so-called code concepts. Uh, these mostly came from the neighborhood plan. These concepts included creating a sense of place, compact urban form, and pedestrian orientation. The consultant used the code concepts to prepare a discussion draft for public review. And as we proceeded with the public review, it occurred to us that there was no particular reason to limit the applicability of this new zone to just West Salem and just one site in West Salem. Uh, but rather, if this was something that was appropriate for developing areas, uh, it could be something suitable for other areas of the city, such as South Salem. Um, additionally, our original concept was to create the zone and recommend that it be applied at the same time to the bonus state property. But during the public outreach process, uh, it was confusing to folks about, well, what, so are you talking about a site-specific proposal or are you talking about a general new zone? And so because of that confusion, we thought, okay, it would be better to do this in two steps. First step, 
create the zone, bring it forward. If the city council thinks it's something that should be uh, approved and added to the zoning ordinance, then our intent will be to bring back a city-initiated rezone of the bonus state property and apply it to that property. Um, the initial public outreach was conducted over several months uh, to present the discussion draft and gather public input. Today, there have been five community forums, three planning commission hearings, three planning commission work sessions, along with a joint work session with the, the council. We, the staff has discussed the proposal with the land use network on five separate occasions. Um, at every stage of the process, and I think this is really telling uh, really telling about the Planning Commission. At every stage of the process, the Commission told us to go back and do more public outreach if there was any indication from the public that there was still an interest in providing more comment. So this has taken quite a while to get this far, but one of the big reasons for that is the Commission's commitment to adequate and thorough public involvement. Uh, as they say, the devil's in the details. And to this end, we've prepared a frequently asked question sheet uh, that in which we've tried to summarize the, the concerns that came up in the public process and express it in terms of questions, and then we provide staff responses to those questions. Um, at the end of the planning commission process, I think it's important to note that only one person came to the meeting and actually spoke in opposition to the proposal. The, the ordinance approved by the Planning Commission has subsequently been reviewed by the Unified Development Code team, or in other words, Randall Tosh, Vicki Woods, myself, and Bryce Bishop, um, and has subsequently been reformatted now into the UDC format. And so uh, we, we took it back to the Planning Commission and got their concurrence that it still reflects the, the, uh, the ideas and the concepts that they think are important. Um, the ordinance bill before you is in two parts, so now I'll give you the overview. The, it's in two parts. One is the zone, and the other part is a neighborhood center mixed use master plans chapter. The zone establishes the criteria to rezone property to NCMU, and the master plan chapter establishes the, the uh, process and the standards and the criteria for approving actual development of a mixed use center in one of these zones. Major components of the master plan chapter are directly related to the commission's efforts, and they were extensive efforts, to balance the need to provide for this alternative um, development type with the need to also provide flexibility to a would-be developer uh, that would allow them to respond to changes in the market. And so the 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 Planning Commission was particularly interested in making sure that this ordinance will work for local Salem developers that may have some limited financial capacity and need some flexibility to uh, experiment with this type of a, uh, approach. Um, so as a result of the Commission's efforts to balance these two interests, the Commission is recommending, on the one hand, a set of very detailed and comprehensive development standards covering a broad range of concerns, but then on the other hand, the Commission is recommending three options for master plan approval, and a developer under these options may propose a detailed master plan, this is the class one example, a detailed plan for the entire district if they're, if they're confident enough and they're, they're, they're um, comfortable being committed to the whole site, uh, they can go that way if they want to, if they're confident and they're comfortable being committed, but they want to phase the development in a particular timeline and sequence, they can do a class two or a phased approach. If they want to rather than commit to the whole uh, master plan at one time, but a sub area, instead of sub area, they can do the class three approach, do one sub area, get a master plan, a detailed plan approved for that, then as that goes along and, and they're, they're confident they can take the next step, they bring in another sub-area plan and that goes through a public process and a master plan can be approved for that second and third and fourth sub-area, et cetera. So those are the three options for master plan. And then in addition, the commission um, created three types of development standards, again, in order to further provide that, f that needed flexibility. Um, 
I will close the overview of the proposal with, I think, five points that I think are particularly important. One is the proposal represents the Planning Commission's best thinking about how to provide an alternative option to a traditional residential and commercial development that responds to our changing needs. Two, this proposal has built-in features to be compatible with established single-family neighborhoods. Three, both open space preservation and pedestrian orientation are required. And uh, four, apartments are allowed, but they're only allowed in the core above the commercial floor. And finally, uh, the commission has included hours of operation limitations that are intended to discourage inappropriate commercial uses, uh, such as a nightclub. So in conclusion, I know the Planning Commission is proud of both the amount of time and thought they put into this, as well as the great lengths they took to ensure adequate uh, public opportunity to comment. Uh, the Commission recognizes that these concepts uh, are different than what we have today, um, but they believe that the proposal provides for an innovative and alternative way uh, as an option for future development that responds to our changing needs while still protecting our existing residential neighborhoods. Thank you. I believe Director Woods has a few comments she'd also like to make. Thank you, Glenn. I just wanted to talk about how this proposal is different than what we have today. So I wanted to talk about why this is not like a planned unit development. Some of you have been through planned unit development review. That is a process. It's not a zone, it's a process. And in it, it allows some small mixture of uses and it can be applied anywhere in a residential or commercial zone. That's not the case with this particular proposal. Um, with, a PU, with this proposal, you can have more commercial than you could have in that, but you can't have um, apartments per se, other than just being on top of uh, uh, commercial development. And this proposal requires a certain amount of open space, whereas the PUD ordinance only allows for open space. It doesn't specify how much. And this proposal has a much higher level of standards when it comes to design and development. So this is not like a PUD because first of all, you have to rezone the property. You have to change both the comprehensive plan designation and the zoning in order to apply this zone anywhere. So it would have to be a mixed use comprehensive plan designation and an NCMU zone if you approve it and it's created. Um, this is also different than overlay zones would be, because an overlay zone is designed to overlay other zones. So you don't have to go through, again, a comprehensive plan or zone change, and there's no master plan required, which is required for this. So that's how it differs from overlay zones. It differs from the other zones that we have in that there's a higher level of criteria about where it's located. Most zones in our community, you can just come in and request a zone change, and it's considered on its merits by the plan Planning Commission and the City Council, and it can be approved. This has some stricter criteria. It's got some size limitations, um, and it's got some locational limitations that other zones that we have in the community don't have. It's different than our single family zones. This is not a single family zone because it allows a heck of a lot more flexibility than that. It has much higher design standards. It's the, almost the equivalent in the density or the number of housing units that would be allowed, but allows a mixture of uses. Again, it requires open space, pedestrian friendly design, those kinds of things that you would not find in a single family zone, and it requires a master plan, so you have to look at the property as a whole. It's different from our multifamily zones because it doesn't allow that level of intensity of development and it doesn't allow apartments. Again, it does allow a mixture of uses and it requires a master plan, which you would not find in our multifamily zones. And it's different than our commercial zones because the commercial zones don't allow residential mixed in without having to go through some extra hoops, and so this encourages um, residential use, but it only allows residential use, single family residential use outside the core area. And you can see on this map where the core area is, this is kind of an idea of what one would look like if it met all the requirements. Um, you can only have single family kinds of development in different sorts of arrangements. Lot sizes can be different um, than they are in the typical single family zone, but it doesn't allow you to just have apartments spread throughout. So I wanted to make sure the council had a good understanding of how this is different than what we have on the books today before you start taking testimony and uh, begin to deliberate on this. Thank you, Kim. Did you? No? Well, that was very good. 
Uh, why don't we hear from the public now? Uh, Car I'll just call you in order as you've signed up. Uh, Carla Kanan? If you could identify yourself and uh, your ward, address, whatever you prefer. Good evening. It's Carla Kane in, in Gemma Street, Northwest Salem, so Dan Clums area. Um, I have been part of these discussions. I have been part of those meetings. I've also involved my neighborhood called the Heights in it. I've gone door to door. You'll see a group letter from us. Um, also, some residents submitted their own letters also that may have had some additional points to make. So I want to point out that we have been watching this very closely, and I've been participating in the West Salem Neighborhood Association. Um, we also have some additional concerns. Some neighbors voice the hours of operation. 1 a.m. is still too late. Salem closes down. And also, you have to understand, too, that the workers will be throwing up the trash and banging the stuff all those hours. And we don't see really why something would be open that late. But that was just one person's sidebar conversation with me. We also say that the guidelines may or may we want to make sure those guidelines are more firm and always are adhered to as the process goes through because guidelines get a little wishy-washy as different personnel change over as time goes on. So we want to make sure that stays through because we absolutely love that there's no fast food drive throughs but we have other options for drive throughs But the fast food cuts down on um, pedestrian friendly. And also, where you're going to place it, if it is in West Salem and you have a drive through with the high school there, sorry, that will not be a pretty situation. Um, also, we, want, we also are very, very concerned with a couple of other things. The placement of one of these units to another one. We don't want strip malls, quasi-development for commercial sites. The original wording was one per major intersection. When we went back, way back to the West Salem stuff, when it came back, it's now one-eighth of a mile. That is very, very close and very, very congested. And especially if you're looking at the Orchard Heights as the test case, look at what we have now that we didn't have three or four years ago. We now have a school, two schools, a high school, another school. Okay, so it's going to get a little congested. So I would suggest really looking at that, what an eighth of a mile really means. And our West Salem Neighborhood Association can talk more about that. Um, also, we do not like the fact that the PUD approval plan may be different than, um, excuse me, the approval plan for this is different than the PUD approval plan. We still want to be notified up front when these are being applied to because as you can see, we are very concerned about this. We are concerned about it in the future. We've been sticking with this for now how many years. And as these come to line, we want to make sure we're heads up and not trying to catch up because a better play, pay attention to it up front than the details later where we can't make it up. And that's it. Thank you. I had one question, if you, sure. if you don't mind. Uh, I haven't had a chance to race through this material yet to see if your concerns are in here in I writing. I did. I, I to did there, to yeah. um, solidify things, we just wrote it down as two quick opposed, which is the eight, one eighth of a mile, and one which is also we suggest strongly that you put in the approval um, process as a, a same as a PUD. And other people will speak further on that that are more knowledgeable. But from what I understand, we want the upfront notification. Just say, hey, it's a head up coming, so we can start our process of looking at it instead of running around neighborhoods when you've got a beautiful sunny day, talking to people on the doors and trying to make sure emails are going through. Uh, some of my neighbors I never even spoke to, and they were very concerned, and I, hopefully they sent more e emails since I last checked. And, and your neighborhood, is it in the, uh, are you in the neighborhood where a, a proposed development yes, is? Yes, we're kitty corner from the Bone property, okay. the Heights subdivision. So we are seeing a great deal of impact. We still don't know what the school's going to do to us. Um, we know what the high school already does. We're also backing up um, Lanagard people not ever having a cut through from a neighborhood into one of these. So we're concerned too. We don't want to see cut through traffic because then our livability shrinks as every UPS driver cuts through those areas and everybody tries to avoid that intersection. So that's something that's on a sub-level planning thing to be careful about um, when, we, we, when you start developing anything when there's already an established residential area. Those kids in the streets, I'm sorry, there's no backyards to play in and parks are few and far in between sometimes, and so we need to make sure our kids who are running out in the streets anyways are careful. Great. Councillor Tesser, you had a question? Thanks for coming down. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend you and your approach to this, because from what I'm hearing, um, I'm not hearing no. Correct. I'm not hearing no. I'm hearing 
we have some issues, but if these issues could be corrected, it would be okay with us. That's what I'm hearing from you. Especially from my point of view, because I have lived around the country and I've seen these being built before subdivisions built, and that makes a lot of sense. But now we're kind of go back and infill, and I do have the um, option. I have driven through Cordon Road, and I have driven in South Salem. And people do choose to live in certain areas. They want the country, they want that urban, and I kind of think of West Salem as a suburb. I don't think driving down to Taggart's a big deal, and I don't see us going further up the hill. So, but having a mom and pop center just to run to get an ice cream would be a nice option. But anything bigger than a Walgreens type store, it's just, you know, we can go down the hill. And I don't even shop in this area. I go down Commercial Street to do my big shopping. I know other people go out Mission Street to do their big shopping a week. It's those last minute touches we miss, but then I'll go to a Ross. I won't go to a 7-Eleven type. And I don't, we don't want one of those either. We want that limited hour. We're concerned about students nearby. Um, we're concerned about the sounds, I lived in the city in, in Connecticut and it was the, the sound of the, the guys dumping the trash after the place closed. So if you, if, if they put the trash heap right beside the residential, no. If they put it in the corner with buffering, it might work. But that's the devil in the details, so please pay attention to it when that starts coming. That those are the kinds of things that ruin a night's sleep for a nurse or for, for an overexhausted mother. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, John, Mr. Cowie. Can I start? You can. Uh, first, uh, President Chuck Bennett and members of the City Council, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify for the recommended new ordinance of the Neighborhood Center Mixed Use, which is NCMU, that was adopted by the Planning Commission on May 3rd, 2011. I wish to provide you with historical overview of our family involvement with the City of Salem. In June of 2006, I was contacted by the community development staff to consider developing a portion of our party in West Salem at the corner of Orchard Heights and Dogsbury Road as NCMU. This concept was recommended by the West Salem Neighborhood Plan and was adopted by the City Council on March 8, 2004. After consulting with several individuals, including some members of the West Salem Neighborhood Plan Steering Committee, the family agreed to work with the Salem City staff to change our zone from residential agricultural to NCMU. The city established a group called the Project Management Team with representatives from the West Salem Neighborhood Association, Salem Kaiser School District, Salem Transportation, Salem Parks, and several staff members from the community development. A consultant firm was hired by the city of Salem. Stakeholders with six different groups were in, interviewed in the West Salem area to receive their input for the development of the new zone. These focus group, including West Salem School Administrators, Glenn Gibson Watershed Council, West Salem Business Association, Landigard Drive homeowners, and other neighborhood groups in the West Salem area. The project management team met six times with consultants and provided a draft for the new NCMU zone code. The public outreach campaign for this project was comprehensive. They Procedural finding of the staff report summarized the campaign in detail, which included three public forums held throughout the city in 2009-2010. A final draft of the NCMU was completed and submitted to the uh, Salem Planning Commission. We are most grateful to the Salem Planning Commission for their time, 
patience and willingness to go through several public hearings. Also, we are pleased that this new ordinance com uh, uh, me, encompasses the city of Salem as a whole. We sincerely hope the council will act favorable to this new ordinance. We have, we don't have any more two concerns. We have only one concern. I'm going to skip the first one. And the second one is basically omits sidewalks from unable open space. I'm going to have Mark Schickman to speak about that. We sincerely hope that the council will review these sections and make proper adjustment. This has been a long process of constant work to get to this phase. We are grateful to members of the Planning Commission, city staff, and other groups and individuals for their hard work and efforts in presenting this ordinance for your consideration and hopefully approval. Thank you, Chuck Bennett. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Cowie. Could you, for the record, just identify yourself? Yes, and I'm sorry. My name is John Miss Cowie. I live on 1761 Cumulus Court, Northwest Salem, 97304. Great. Thank you very much. And, and uh, by the way, I think oh, I did send that report to you, but it was after 5 p.m., but ah. you have it as a public record. Yes, and thank you for providing it in writing. And thank you, just, uh, just as an aside, uh, for your tremendous patience in working through what is obviously a very complicated process and volunteering uh, to, to find out how the whole thing works. You apparently, you probably know more about this than any of us could hope to at this well, point. So thank you very much for thank your you. patience. Councilor Clem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, John, thanks for coming down. And again, five years, has it been four Correct. or five years? Okay. Um, I, I just want to develop a perspective as you are involved with the Bone Estate property, Correct. either as an owner or as a representative. That property currently is zoned, and, and this ordinance, while it uh, could affect any property that meets the criteria of the ordinance, Correct. the newspaper featured the Bone yeah, Estate I property. Don't know why, so but I, I, I hope folks don't get to believe Correct. that it's only about one person's opportunity. But I want to make sure I understand the zoning. The Bona State property is zoned single family residential. That's correct. And approximately how many houses could be built on that property if if alternatives weren't developed to single family zoning? Uh, it's really hard to say. Um, I think like any other residential development for 37 acres, um, you know, you can figure how many homes per acres and multiply it by 37. <laughs> I think you can get the count. So yeah. three, if it's 10 homes per acre or six homes per that's acre, it'd be whatever several. Whatever the code, these are the possibilities, but we don't have any plans. But that's a good criteria. And, I, and I, the only reason I bring that up is I want to recall the original discussion that uh, the land use chair brought to me and to you. And that was as an alternative to just creating sprawl, creating right. another 200 or 300 right. rooftops. Right. Um, it, it made sense to have some sort of discussion about what are some more creative things happening around the country, and absolutely, I and think you were willing to to say I'll not build those homes and and see about the uh, <coughs> the business of getting a mixed use zone. Oh, absolutely, we okay. like that, and I think uh, for some of you have been in other mixed use, for example, in Bend, uh, Northwest Crossing. It's a huge area, but this is a smaller scale, but it's so wonderful to go to mixed use where you have homes, you have seniors, you have children, neighbors coming in and use, utilizing these facilities. And this is happening in many places. We, we really like that because my family experience living in mixed uses and we love it. We just park the car and walk there, do our things. Uh, we have a library, we have grocery store, we have antique store, you know, there are a lot of things. And this brings the community together. Well. So principally, not because of you know, the development, because of the concept, it's really very good, and I want to congratulate the staff to come up with an idea like that, and we support that. Thank you. Are there any further questions, comments? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Mark Shipman. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Mark Shipman. I'm an attorney at 250 Church Street uh, South East here in Salem, Suite 300, with uh, the Sawfield Griggs Law Firm. 
uh, representing John and Judy Miscawi and also uh, Christine Hart, the, the heirs of the Bone Estate. Our firm uh, was contacted by uh, John Miscawi in, in uh, prior to 2006, and we've been working actively with him uh, since 2006. Uh, we have been um, working very closely with, uh, with your staff and um, th with your staff through the consultants in trying to come up with a, a proposed ordinance that you have in front of you this evening that we think uh, has, pr has been vetted pretty well, um, not only from the stakeholder groups, but also through the Planning Commission. Um, the important thing is that this is something that the West Salem neighborhood uh, plan calls for. It calls for this, this type of a, of a zone to be put in, and a lot of effort has gone into essentially creating the proposed uh, the proposed zone, and, and, and once this gets into the code, it's our desire to essentially have an application made that would actually change a portion of the, Moscow, of the bonus state property to be able to have this zone put on it. Um, another interesting factor is, uh, is Glenn identified that they went out into the, in the West Salem community and they contacted all of the major property owners out there. And there was only one, and that was, that was the Miscawi family and the Hart family that said they were willing to be the guinea pigs to go through this process. It, no one else was willing to step up and say, me too, we're interested. And we've really been the ones that have been at the table uh, trying to make this, uh, make this into an ordinance that would work. As John identified, um, well, before I go there, um, we've also engaged, the, the family's engaged engineering firms. We've also had commercial realtors work alongside with us in order to review the proposed ordinances to make sure this is gonna be something that's gonna work in the market. We didn't wanna have something imposed um, and come into play that wouldn't, that wouldn't work in a practical way. And so we're, we really feel good about that, both from an engineering standpoint and with respect to, and with respect to the guidelines that are in there and with respect to what we think um, could, th what this market could, um, uh, could put out there in a mixed use zone like this. Uh, our only minor change that we have is that under the open space definition in section, proposed section 215.005 sub J, uh, we would like to include sidewalks uh, within, the, within the definition of usable open space. And our theory is this, is that, is that this development is gonna include a lot more sidewalks than you would typically find in your typical single family um, residential subdivision. And those sidewalks are gonna be integral parts to that open space, getting moving people from, um, from commercial to the residential to from open space to open space. Our desire is that would be included in that definition so that could be included in the calculations. And finally, with respect to the comment, um, uh, that was that Carla made earlier uh, regarding pre-notification. We're fine with that. Um, you know, frankly, in, anything that that we're going to be bringing forward on a property like this, or frankly, any developer is going to be bringing forward of a magnitude of this type, it, they're going to need to go to the neighborhood association early and often. And so I'm I'm fine. I think we're fine with that from putting that in the code. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shipman. Any questions, Councilor Nanke? Coming down, Mark. Actually, you answered the uh, first question, which was going to be is in regards to uh, pre-notification issues. Second uh, question would be then, are there any other zones where the sidewalk is allowed to be considered open space? Uh, I don't believe so. Did you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either, although we probably have to do some research to make sure that's true. We don't. We don't have a lot of requirements for open space, to tell you the truth, in the code anywhere, so we don't address that very often. Just because I know in industrial there is a certain portion that has to be, and I don't, I think it has to be true green, not even gravel or uh... Yeah, that's a little bit different yeah. requirement, I think, than open space. Thanks. Councilor Clem. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Shipman, um, the pre-notification process that we've talked about, is that very similar to what was stated earlier that Carla brought up, the process like a PUC? Is it, do you equivocate the two, that the notification that's similar under the PUC code? Uh, when you say we're okay with the pre-notification process, uh, do you think that the two are the same? Um, I, 
think so, Dan. I, we're, I, I haven't, I haven't, um, I've been out of town. Okay. And so I've not seen um, the request that the West Salem Neighborhood Association has as far as pre-notification. I've just heard about it uh, over voicemails. And um, I, I'm fine with the concept. I mean, we can make it work. Sure. I, again, I don't, I don't see pre-notification to, uh, to filing something, whether it's before a pre-app conference or after a pre-app conference. Again, I, I don't see that as being a big deal. I think any developer that's going to come in um, and, and request this type of zone on their property or come in with a, with a development application, again, it's going to have to be coming early and often to the Neighborhood Association and with staff sure. uh, to make sure that it, that it works. Okay. Thank you. Any further uh, questions? Thank you. Thank you. E.M. Easterly. President Bennett, members of the uh, City Council, I am E.M. Easterly, 775 Fir Gardens Northwest. Uh, I'm here this evening representing the West Salem Neighborhood Association and realize that I, there's a lot of clutter and ideas going around and I've passed out a document to you, the first page of which is uh, a motions that were adopted by the Neighborhood Association talking about things that were on the Neighborhood Association's wish list. Uh, as I read through the ordinance that was brought to this organization back in June, I saw, thought, wow, there's a lot of the I's that have been dotted and a lot of the T's crossed. And that while one could quibble, and you have heard some concerns that have been raised, the bottom line is that the Neighborhood Association in the good offices of the Planning Commission did not get everything it wanted. I think that's part of the public process. You have to have give and take and find a point of view. And as Mr. Shipman has talked about one little topic, there you, you heard uh, uh, Ms. Cannon speak about, well, we really only want one of these uh, in an area. Remember the title we're talking about. Two ordinances, one talks about a zoning it's called a neighborhood center mixed use. It's not an excuse for a commercial area. It's not a replacement for, for a commercial area. So this neighborhood association very much wants to support the concept that it's a neighborhood use area. And if somebody wants to develop an area for greater commercial, let them go for commercial zoning. Now remember, no one said this with the smallest commercial area in this in this particular proposed zone is one acre with two acres of other use. The largest is five acres with, fifth, with 10 acres of other use. So these are not a big spectrum in terms of development. The other items that I've passed on to you that I believe, and, and I, I'm sorry, uh, keepers of the light, I'm hoping that I'm being provided with the opportunity of the Neighborhood Association's timing here. I will try to keep it as brief as possible. I'd like you to turn to the last page I handed to you. The proposed new ordinance regarding the purpose of the plan process is to encourage innovative planning as Ms. Harden Wood said to you earlier, this is a planning process. A, the first zone or the first ordinance is a zoning ordinance, but the 30 some pages that are in the 49 pages of this ordinance are about the planning process. Look at the bottom. Consistent application of coherent vision for entire area. That really answers, even though it's only a purpose statement, the kind of concept that the Planning Commission brought to this effort and that the staff in trying to translate this into the new code format really did try to dot the I's and cross the T's. So I think there's room there. There's one other area that I'd like to turn to and that is on the 
legal size piece of paper. We've already heard it discussed several times. And it's a comparison of the uh, to, uh, an existing chapter, 121, which talks about PUDs, planned unit development, and the proposed language of the master plan for a mixed use center. And then the language that the neighborhood association was asking for is at the bottom of that second hand, the second line of the uh, second column in a little larger print. Within five business days of the pre-app conference, the neighborhood organization within whose boundary the proposed plan development is located shall be notified of the proposal, its location, size, and general development concept. There's some language we would greatly request that this body put into the part of the ordinance that talks about creating this plan. I'd like to stress one more point. This really is for every part of Salem. If you lock on, as everyone seems to want to do, because the genesis of this came out of West Salem as something for just West Salem, that's not the right thing. What we need at this point is an ordinance that can be used anywhere in the community. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Easterly? Councillor Cannon? Good evening. Um, you said something in you emphasized it twice, so let me come back to it. My reading of the ordinance would permit this type of zone on all four corners of a major intersection. As it stands right now, that is correct. Good. Uh, thank you very much. All four corners of a major intersection, if you have three acres or 15 acres, or how does that work? If you have a minimum of three acres, you could do it. If you have 15 acres, you could do it. As it is currently set in writing, those are all permitted. So it's three acres up to 15 acres. Correct. Okay. And of that three acres, only one of it would be commercial. What if I have seven acres? If you have seven acres, then you have the same proportional opportunities. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you could do the math in your head. Really. <laughs> same proportional is good math. That's good. <laughs> Councillor Clem. Ian, thank you very much for your work on, on this. And uh, you were one of the original originators of, of the idea um, that we should get away from the traditional subdivisions on every hillside. Um, I, I wanted to, or I'm crediting you with that. That's right. I, I'm as guilty as many others are. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that neighborhood association under, or it, it is supportive of, if it is three acres, that one acre would be um, mixed use and two acres would be residential? Not necessarily, because okay. there is, as uh, staff earlier pointed out, a provision for open space. And that would be defined based upon what, whatever is in the property in question. It could be a riparian area. Sure. It could be lawns. I mean, it, the, the uniqueness and potential opportunity of these two ordinances, and again, we're talking about two ordinances, sure. is to allow for planning and creative thinking in terms of how we adjust to and try to address beyond the, the, the point that uh, uh, Mr. Gross talked about a changing world. Let's face it, there are people who like their little suburban residential area and are willing to drive a mile, two miles, five miles for all commercial opportunities. That's a reality. There are folks like that, I'm sure in this room, and I know there are throughout West Salem. What we are offering, or I hope the city is offering, and you as the city council will say, let's put another tool in the toolbox that will allow this community to have a zone and a process that will give the same sort of potential opportunity that's not elsewhere. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a corner on a couple of roads that meet a certain qualification when we talk about West Salem. The Planning Commission went through the process and looked at where other places throughout the city, those same opportunities could be there. That's what this ordinance is about. 
we in West Salem stuck our heads up and said, yep, and specifically the Bowen Estate uh, representatives are the one who said, yes, yes, and I'd like for us to get on with it, and it may not be perfect, but the Neighborhood Association is absolutely supporting this concept, and just ask out loud for certain tweaks. And I'm gonna, if, if with your permission, uh, Councillor Clem, I'd like to add two cents to the question that I was asked earlier. Yes, you can put it on all four corners. Would a neighborhood association like the West Salem uh, Neighborhood Association, being we're talking about a neighborhood, not a commercial, but a neighborhood mixed use center, be supportive of that? Uh, I'm gonna let you decide that yourself. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Easton. Any further questions? Councilor Nang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One last question. If I recall in the original plan, there was actually two of these designated, and they were both along Wallace Road. One ah. up close and one down next to the store on... Uh... Yes. In, in the, if we go back to 04, when the West Salem Neighborhood Plan was identified, that plan, if you would go look at it right now, would show one uh, near the intersection of Brush College, Brush College right. and Wallace Road. And the third one has a couple of churches on it right now. Right. Okay. That was the corner of Eola and Dokes Ferry. Okay. So things change over time, and thank you for raising that issue. Right, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Don Hometh. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I can't add anything important to small caps. Okay. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, Ted Campbell. Mr. Chair, City Councilman, my name is Ted Campbell. I represent the members of West Salem that belong to Polk County Americans for Prosperity. And I just have some questions on this. Number one, they were talking about families downsizing. I know you have a, a senior facility, but if they lived in the apartments above that and they're in a wheelchair, how the hell are they going to get up there unless you guys put a lift in for them? Number two, if they have an apartment on top of a business, who's going to pay for the rain runoff? That I know he's planning on charging both of them, right? So you get more money. <laughs> but somebody's got to decide those things too. And how's the city going to like businesses, little boutiques moving out of Salem to move over there because they can't operate on, operate two stores. And if they want to go over there, they're going to have to close down here, which is going to take money from this part, move it over there. And finally, I think you ought to put a zero growth in West Salem until you get some bridges over there. Between West Salem, Independence, and Monmouth, and Dallas, you put another 10 to 15,000 cars a day on those two bridges. And you need to get those bridges done before you do anything to put more people going over there. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Campbell? OK, thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, comment on the neighborhood mixed use zone? President Bennett, members of the City Council, I'm Dan Dorn. I reside at, or my P.O. box is 3577, Salem, Oregon. Um, I'm here tonight as a citizen, but I was also on the Planning Commission that did the work on this. And um, I have, uh, I want to say Mr. Gross did a, an excellent job presenting uh, what you have before you this evening. Um, I saw some antenna go up. Uh, when it was pointed out that you could put uh, one of these on four corners of an intersection. And uh, the Planning Commission uh, thought long and hard on that. And at one time, uh, I think we had it where you could only have one. Um, but as we thought it through, and if you look at the, uh, the projection piece up there, this is a neighborhood center mixed use. Um, it, I if it is, uh, if the market accepts this uh, and you had these on four corners, it, I, I don't think it would be um, unattractive. I heard a comment tonight about a strip mall where perhaps a strip mall look where you had uh, two of these fairly close together. Again, I think to meet these requirements, 
uh, it, you'd be hard pressed to make it look like a strip mall. And that certainly wasn't the intent of the Planning Commission when we thought this thing through. And um, I will reiterate, we uh, started the process on, I think, uh, July of 2008, and we finished it in July of 2010. So we have uh, had this out in front of the public for two years. We had a website. We've had uh, brochures and flyers. Um, and we have done everything uh, that we possibly could do to get the public involved in this. And we really have had uh, very few negative comments. And, and I do like um, and appreciate uh, the concerns that citizens have. And, and, um, and some were brought up today. Uh, speaking of one was the, uh, the time of operation and all those things are negotiable. But tonight you, before you is the uh, charge of are you going to accept this zone and create a new tool for Salem's Toolbox for uh, development in the future. And I hope you support it. Thank you very much. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, former head of the Planning Commission. Um, question came up in several of the emails and what have you as far as just the lack of participation from the public. Um, did it look like there was very few people that actually, one, knew what was going on, or two, uh, cared to comment, or what would you attribute the potential for, for low turnout if, in fact, um, there really was? Yeah, I think that there was somewhat low uh, uh, participation. When we did the public forums, uh, they were not well attended. I think part of it is until it's your ox that's being gored, you you don't put up the fight. And um, the uh, largest attendance came in West Salem, and um, most of the individuals were there to comment on the West Salem proposal and not necessarily on the zone itself, so. Okay, thanks. Dan, I, uh, my ward is a, a pretty much developed area, uh, fairly close in. I have some, uh, some areas that this might out at Cordon Road, but just looking at sort of the interior neighborhoods, how will this apply to those? You're, you're experienced in this area. What, what happens? Uh, I, and I'm not sure which streets would qualify as, say, Madison and Capitol or something like that. What would, would this work there? Would this have an application in those developed neighborhoods? I think, uh, as I recall, Madison and Capitol uh, 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 that, that particular location, I don't think it would work okay. because I don't think you have the land. We did ask the city and they provided us a map of all the areas where, uh, where this could go, uh, this zone could be applied. And there were more than I thought there would be, but um, uh, yeah. I guess you, if it was a, back to Madison and Capitol, if it was a redevelopment plan, someone would have to acquire a minimum of three acres and uh, up to 15 acres and then bring that forward and and then perhaps it could. Dan, I saw that map uh, and it, it's something that caught my attention. It's been a year, year and a half ago or something like that. I saw it and it, it was sort of a series of purple. Is that the map you're talking about? As I recall, yes. It pretty much turned Salem purple. I mean, it seemed like every place in town, if you... <laughs> If you put it, if you overlaid this, became suddenly eligible for this. If you could put together the acreage, I don't remember it being uh, that purple. Maybe I was just kind of surprised to see so much purple. It looked awfully purple. Do we have copies of that map, Vicky? Yes, we can put it have up. Have those been supplied to the council? No, but we have it with us tonight. If if you'd like to see it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank so. you, Councilor Tesla. You can't run away just quite yet, Dan. So I have a question for you, and um, I'm just trying to figure this out. When the Planning Commission um, got this, this zone, I'm just kind of, you know, the idea was that it would be pedestrian friendly overall. So 
I'm just trying to figure out why you would add in uh, drive throughs The conversation was that to create a development that would attract or be friendly to financial institutions, we needed a drive through because there are people that have security concerns uh, when they're doing their banking. And that was probably the main um, business that we were considering. But I do believe uh, it prohibits drive through for restaurants and food, so yeah. Okay, thank you. You bet. Councilor Cannon. Cannon, you just did yeoman's work when you were on the Planning Commission, and I want to thank you publicly. Um, my concern, and I want you to respond, this is just not a rhetorical question, but my concern relates to having every corner of an inter intersection available for this type of development. And it's not just right at the intersection, it can be back 660 feet from the intersection. Um, did that come up in the Planning Commission uh, review at all? Yes, we did discuss that. And again, uh, when you take a look at this and start to really digest it, um, you'll, I think my vision anyway is that it isn't going to be a very, a real dense commercial development. I think it will have a, a softening look to it when you put in all the components. And one of the components to uh, this zone is an open space. So that, that was our consideration and our thought. The other um, thing you might consider is um, city staff went all over West Salem asking the property owners if they would like to participate in a, an experiment or a zone like this, and they only found one individual willing to take that chance. Um, if it, it's understood that if, if this is successful and the market sees potential, then there'll be greater potential for more developments like this. Right now, that doesn't exist. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Anyone else want to address council on this issue? All righty. Uh, councilors, any questions for staff? Mr. Councilor Tesler. <clears throat> Thank you. I've got a whole raft of them, so I'll just start at the top. Um, I think for a lot of folks, when you think about the stuff, I'm trying to get an idea in my mind um, of what would be an NCMU. So the first thing I thought of was Broadway, the new Broadway development. Would that, if we would have had an NCMU at the time, would that have been a neighborhood mixed use zone? I I don't I doubt it. I think I think doing this in a um, already developed area is going to be hard because you have to accumulate enough acreage to be able to do that. Um, Broadway would be close, but it doesn't have the open space. Um, and, and to do that in an, as a redevelopment is going to be very difficult to do. So while the map shows lots of dots where it could actually happen is probably way, way less than that. Okay. So that, I was just trying to visualize, you know, without thinking of Portland, of course, but um, because I can think, you know, I'm thinking of Selwood, Multnomah Village, Broadway, you know, all those little communities that sort of the city grew up around and then they became just pretty much what we're talking about tonight, which is these mixed use zones. Okay. Um, can you give me an example of a 30,000 square foot building? that I can visualize, please? I was just asking Glenn that. I think the new Trader Joe's is about 17,000 square feet. I okay. think that the Vista Roths is about 40,000 square feet. Does that okay. give you a sense of the scale? Yes, perfect, thank you. Um, these zones do not allow multifamily? That's correct, so other than over commercial development. And only in the core, because commercial development is limited to the core, so. Multifamily on the second floor or third floor above commercial in the core is allowed. Otherwise, um, row houses, cottages, 
duplexes. Same duplexes. Same house. Same house. Yes. House would be right. Okay, but not the uh, when you think of multifamily, the not huge the building no. with billions of people not living in it. Okay. No. Um, how, how would this zone encourage pedestrian use over motor vehicle use? Can you well, give me some examples? Well, it, there are several features that are built into it that promote pedestrian orientation. For example, um, there are streets that are required to be designated as pedestrian streets, and these are streets with, that have special sidewalks wider than you would normally see, eight feet uh, in size or greater. Um, there, there is a, um, a, a requirement that the development that is built in the core be more, at least it encourages more compact uh, commercial uses, which would facilitate pedestrian access. There's a requirement that streets that serve the, 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 the link the, uh, the center to the surrounding public street system have pedestrian uh, either walkways and or you know, bikeways as well. Um, so I, those are the ways that kind of. Okay, those are great out. examples. Thank you. That's very helpful. And then um, could you uh, kind of briefly illustrate the differences between um, neighborhood notification for uh, an uh, NCMU and a PUD? Well, it, the notification would be the same except for the provision that uh, Mr. Easterly was referring to, which has to do with pre-application conferences. When a pre-application conference is held on a PUD, then within five business days of that conference, we send out a notice to the neighborhood association letting them know about that. Other than that, the notice would be the same for any, um, this would be, in our jargon, a type three permit process, one that requires a public hearing. So 250 feet surrounding all the property owners within 250 feet, as well as the neighborhood association would get notice. It, it, but significantly, the difference between the PUD and the NCMU is that the PUD is kind of an overlay. And so the property doesn't have to be in a certain zone for that to apply. So anytime this was proposed, there would first be notice given in a public hearing about whether this should be designated as an NCMU zone. And then if the answer to that is yes, there would be another notice in public hearing that would occur when the actual development proposal came in. Okay, and then my last question has to do with, there was a letter um, in this packet from um, someone at Southfield Grizz, I think, and it had to do with the riparian trees. And I'm kind of wondering if you could kind of briefly go over, this person makes an assert, assertion about the percentage of riparian yeah. trees. Yeah, I believe that was in reference to an earlier version of the ordinance at one point the ordinance specified that if you were seeking a residential density bonus going from six units per acre up to eight units per acre, uh, the ordinance requires, and it still does, additional open space and or riparian corridor protection. The uh, previous version uh, said that um, in addition to that, you had to conserve 50% of the existing trees on the property. Normally, under Chapter 68, our tree ordinance, you have to preserve 25% of the trees. The issue was whether or not you could count trees in the riparian corridor towards that 50%. The previous version said you could not. This, uh, this proposal tonight doesn't, doesn't preclude that, that possibility. You can count the riparian corridor trees towards that 50% of, of, of tree coverage. And I assume the white oak um, protections are still in place? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so those are not superseded by this song? Um, oh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have some questions that may not be able to be answered tonight. I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to bring those up, but I do have some that can be answered tonight. So I think I'll, whatever you'd like to do, okay. I would assume that we will continue this hearing for, yeah, for a couple Yeah, and if, if need be, I'll make that motion that okay. we do. Uh, we only have six members of council yeah. here tonight, and I think uh, something this important should have most of the council. Um, 
Ms. Woods or, or Glenn um, and Kim, good work. Um, counting the sidewalks and usable open space. Um, what's the problem in doing that and did Planning Commission deliberate that? That was a recommendation to allow sidewalks to be counted as usable open space. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I may be just uh, getting old myself, but I don't recall that being a major discussion point during the I don't planning either. commission hearing process. I don't either. What would that ordinance look like? That's the question for as we continue the public hearing. Well, like. right now, open space is, um, the, the reference to it, uh, it includes, you know, landscaped areas, common areas, um, natural areas and so forth. What we would do is specify, if the council was interested in doing that, that that uh, pedestrian walkways be included as part of that. Okay, and uh, I'm, we're trying to create a pedestrian, more friendlier than car yeah. friendly environment. So I'm, I want to, you know, think about well, how do yeah. we provide an incentive to sure. create more walking sure. in and around the area as well as to and from? I, I wonder what that ordinance would change would look like. The PUD like process is provided in SRC 121-151. Vicki, I totally get that a public hearing has to happen first and then the pre-application conference follows after that, after the zone has changed. I understand you don't need to mimic the PUD notification process because PUDs are an overlay. What is wrong though with putting a PUD pre-application proce notification process in this? Nothing, no problem with that. Got it, and I'm, I'd be looking for ordinance language to do that exactly. Um, I want to make sure that uh, in terms of drive up windows, I want to be absolutely clear, Planning Commission and staff recommend that that be allowed for banking and pharmacy purposes, right? Well, actually, the, the current version of the ordinance prohibits drive through facilities only for eating and drinking establishments. Any other drive through facility would be allowed under the, under the current proposal. So banks, yes. Uh, pharmacy, yes. Or if there's some other drive-through facility that I can't think of offhand, that would also be allowed. Oh, like the book bin for the same library? You drop yeah. off your book? Drive-through right. weddings, divorces. Right. Divorces. <laughs> <laughs> Dry cleaners. One, one, um, Dry cleaners could yeah. be one. One clarification to that, because of the way that this ordinance works, and uh, I think the first speaker referenced the guidelines. You know, this is a complicated ordinance, and you're getting, you know, the top little bit of it here. But... Um, the provision that drive-throughs are not allowed for eating and drinking facilities is a guideline. And a guideline is a standard that um, has to be met, it's required to be met, unless an applicant can prove to the Planning Commission that it meets the intent of the zone and there's an alternative standard that could be applied. And in order to achieve that, the applicant would need to convince the Planning Commission during the master plan approval process, which of course is a public hearing process, so the public could weigh in as well. The, the applicant would have to uh, prove to the Planning Commission that several criteria contained in the ordinance can be met, and in fact would be enhanced by the alternative standard. What if we wanted to just make that absolute, not a guideline? Then you'd absolute. make it a non variable standard sure. or, 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 or we put it in the use provision. put it in the use section and, and I'd, just say I'd be interested in what that ordinance language okay. looks like too okay. just hint 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 <laughs> um, guidelines I, I, I'm I'm impassioned by the idea that guidelines were what created a car wash right. or a fish market <laughs> used to be and I'm still <laughs> reeling from that um, I got the fish market. I got the fish market. what would that map look like if the Pro prohibition of nearby NCMUs was a quarter of a mile, not an eighth of a mile or half a mile, but a quarter of a mile. Thank you for asking that question. I did want to clarify the eighth of a mile issue. Yeah. The eighth of a mile standard, actually in the current proposal, the eighth of the mile standard is, that's the, dis the maximum distance one of these centers can be from the intersection. There is no spacing requirement right now for these centers. So, um, at one time, it was the, the, there was a draft that had a spacing requirement. I don't recall, I think it might have been a quarter of a mile apart. Uh, and what did planning, did planning Commission chew on that? They chewed on that a lot. And, and I think um, former Chair Dorn told you that after chewing on it for quite a while, they decided that even if you had one on each 
four corners, or if someone were to do one side by side, they didn't think because of the standards uh, that would have to be adhered to that it would result in a, a bad urban form, that it would result in strip commercial. So they were convinced that it wasn't necessary to have a spacing requirement. Okay, and what's the size of the Walgreens in West Salem? It's not 30,000 square feet, but what size is it? I, I, it we can, can find can out staff, for you. Yeah. Can yeah. staff come yeah. back? Mm -hmm. And yes, um, when it's appropriate, I would make a motion that we extend the public hearing for written comments and responses back to staff <coughs> until like August 8th. It. Okay. And, and would you, when you make that motion, continue it to the second meeting in August? Okay. Um, I, okay. I had a couple questions I wanted to ask. Could you give me an example of a 30,000 square foot building? I, I'm just, what, which one in tech? Just can pick one. I, I, I can give you the in-betweens. Okay. So Trader Joe's, 17,000 square feet. I haven't been there yet. I'm okay. the only person in Salem. <laughs> Roth's yeah, Vista. Well, Clem hasn't gone. Is about 40,000 square feet. Which? Roth's Vista. Liberty and Commercial. So that's the one at Liberty and Commercial, the closest one here to downtown. That's 40,000. About 40,000. Okay. And that is the maximum building size, did I understand The, the that? maximum is 30,000 here. Right, 30,000, right. That's the footprint. So you could have more square footage if you had a more than one story. It's a so maximum a three story, you could have a 90,000 square foot. Yes. Yeah. Just simple. Correct. Math. Proportionate. Um, on the uh, on the map with the purple, are those to scale? Those purple? No, oh. no, <laughs> they're not to scale, okay. and they they're also not representing sites that meet the size criteria. Okay. They're just sites that are within an eighth of a mile of the kind of intersection that this center has to be located on. And just for illustrative purposes, if you had turned to us and said, could you please show us a map everywhere where the commercial retail zone could be applied, that whole thing would be purple. So most zones don't have any limitations on where they can be applied. Okay, great. That, that helps. That helps explain it. Now, I, just following uh, Councillor Clem's questions, I, I'm not sure I tracked well. You can't have in one of these under this ordinance, you couldn't have uh, a food outlet. Is that it? You can't have a food outlet? Oh, yeah. Drive-through food outlet? No. Correct. You, you can't have a drive-through facility for an eating and drinking establishment. But, but you, you can could have, have a car wash um, under uh, this, a drive-through car wash? I don't know. I'm not sure car wash is an allowed use. We'd have to check that. It's not? Uh, so Kim's telling me a car wash is not a permitted use. So you can't have a car wash, you can't have a food and drink establishment. What else can't you have? Well, you can have a, you can have a restaurant, you can have a cafe. But you can't have a drive-thru. You can have a pub. You can't have a drive-thru. No, I'm trying to figure out what you can't drive through on one of these. <laughs> a place that sells food or, or drink. Or washes your car. Well, the only, away. <laughs> the only limitation on drive-throughs is for eating and drinking places. Right. Any other drive-through is permitted along with the use if it's permitted. So if a bank is permitted and they want to have a drive-through, that's okay. If uh, McDonald's is permitted, which it is, but they want to have a drive-through, not okay. Well, the thing I want to understand, uh, Vicki, is sort of down the road. Who are we going to hear from? I mean, we've <laughs> been through this drive-through thing now with West Salem, uh, out on Columbia, downtown for banks. What are we going to see in these mixed-use zones as conflict over drive-throughs? Uh, that's all I want to do is just kind of see where the, where the not permitted or the possibly permitted are. Because you guys brought it up, you mentioned drive, this came up, this drive-through issue, and every time I hear it, it's like a red flag now. <laughs> well, the Planning Commission did talk about this extensively in their process. And there were some folks that thought, you know, if this is a pedestrian-oriented mixed-use center, there shouldn't be any drive-throughs because drive-throughs are associated with automobiles. And we're not talking about facilitating automobile traffic, we're talking about facilitating pedestrian and bikeways, but then some people said, well, 
some kind of drive-through facilities might make some sense, particularly banks. Folks were concerned about um, banking insecurity and or a mother with several small children can't, it's not convenient to, um, to take the, the kids into the bank. So we ought to uh, recognize that and allow that to happen. Um, and at the end of the day, the Planning Commission, after listening to all this, decided that the most onerous example of drive-through facilities were those associated principally with fast food establishments. And so they said, will prohibit drive-through facilities for those uses. There are other uses that are just prohibited, not because they have drive-throughs, not just because they're not appropriate for the center, but for the drive-through facility, they said, the Planning Commission decided we'll prohibit them for fast eating and drinking establishments. They were thinking fast food because those are the most onerous when it comes to conflict with pedestrian and autos. But just, just as a comment uh, aside, this, I find this just really unfathomable. I, as I think about the logic of it, trying to follow it, these are supposedly uh, pedestrian-friendly neighborhood shopping areas. And uh, the issue of drive-throughs for anything just does, makes no sense to me at all with that kind of policy objective. I mean, either it's, it is or it isn't. It, you see what it, I mean? It's a policy decision for you to make as a council. The, the, I think the original pro proposal didn't include drive throughs right. The Planning Commission struggled with that. They listened to the pros and cons, and they've given you a proposal that does include some drive throughs But it is a policy decision related to what is the intent of this zone that you'll need to make as part of this. And that has, is, will that be a drafted uh, amendment we'll have available to us, or how will that work? If so directed, yeah. we would be happy to do that. Absolutely. You have it? We need to see what it would look like. There were, <laughs> there, were two, there were two areas that the Planning Commission probably spent the most time on that I recall. One was the issue of drive throughs and the other one was the issue of how, how large should that footprint be, that maximum footprint be in the commercial core area. Uh, originally, uh, the proposal that was originally took out for public review had a smaller maximum size. I think it was 20,000 square feet. We heard that it should be 50,000 square feet from some folks. Um, the, the Planning Commission, you know, took a lot of input, discussed it extensively. We had a um, someone that has developed a mixed-use center in, in town, Mr. Glenny, uh, come to one of our work sessions and he talked to the commission about what he thought made sense as far as a, a size. At the end of the day, the commission decided prohibit drive throughs for fast food and 30,000 square foot was the right maximum size for the for the commercial. What was Mr. Glenny's maximum size, do you recall? I think he was saying somewhere around the 30,000 square feet was, was something that was a appropriate and necessary for the market. Okay. That's what I recall. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Councillor Cannon? <clears throat> I have several. Um, first of all, can an or could this ordinance be applied to West Salem only? No. This ordinance, if you adopt it, could be applied anywhere it meets the criteria for a comp plan change and a zone change. You must understand my question. Okay. Could it be limited to West oh, Salem Oh, could it only? be? Yes. Okay. Um, it would probably now, require a comp plan amendment to effectively do that. Comp well, the, the regardless of what the process right. is, it is, is a possible alternative. Yes, yes absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, uh, I'm very familiar with Bend, Northwest Crossing, Skyline Crossing. Those were in areas that had yet to be developed. Mm -hmm. Have we thought this through as to the developed subdivisions, such as the older subdivisions and then Ward 7, that someone would go in and acquire three acres of property and put a facility such as this in the middle of Laurel Springs, for example. Um, have we, was that ever discussed in the Planning Commission process? I don't recall that being a major point of discussion. There, there was some discussion about would it be appropriate for this type of center to go into an established developed area. There was some concern expressed by some of the neighborhood associations from the interior area, Grant being one. Um, so it's, 
it, yes, as written, it's possible uh, that someone could go in and acquire enough land, a minimum three acres, uh, and if it had existing structures on it, uh, either conform those or, or rehabilitate those in a way that it would meet the design standards or take them out and start over. Conceivable, we don't think it's likely. Um, I think it's more likely that this is going to be used on property that for whatever reason might be infill, but it's empty, it's, it's undeveloped infill, or more likely, I think, out in the areas that are developing as currently as single family subdivision as an alternative to that. It would this, be. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It would be easier for someone in a developed area to come in and if they want commercial development of some kind, to come in and request to rezone it to a commercial zone. It's, that's way simpler than applying this zone. Historic districts, could this be, could you have a change of the zone to change from an historic district to this? The historic well, exist district is not a zone, so you could have both. Yeah. No. Well, regardless of what the zone would be where you have an historic district designation, <coughs> right. can yes. this go in? It could. Mm -hmm. Both provisions would apply, the historic provisions and then the provisions in this. Okay. The hours of operation, I saw that it was 1 a.m. Um, on the weekends. On the weekends. How about right. I didn't see anything? There's a... There's a weekday difference to 11 o'clock maximum. 11 p.m. Yeah, and then on Friday and Saturdays, it's 1. Okay. Would it be possible to have a codified ordinance? What I have now is attachment E from the planning department, and then I have the June 15, uh, 2010. That was on the website as part of the backup information. You should have, have it. You should have ordinance bill 20-11. Okay. Which is in codified form. All right. Is it in paper form or electronic? Well, yeah, I'd love to have a copy before you leave. And then getting back to Columbia Street and the drive throughs. Um, the, the problem with Columbia Street was all of the noise and the lights associated with the development. Is there anything in this ordinance? I haven't found any, but that's the reason I'm asking the question. That would prohibit the impacts on adjoining neighborhoods that are already existing. I know we have the open space, but there's we have one of the pro one of the things is you can have a kennel for overnight dog boarding. Um, in according to what the planning commission put together, uh, that would be in operation all the time. Mm -hmm. So is there, what's the buffering? It's a 50 foot uh, setback from the, from the core to adjacent single family residential areas. And it's a 30 foot setback from the rest of the center, which is residential, to uh, the existing RS zones. There's also a maximum building height in the core of 45 feet as opposed to the normal 50 foot for, uh, for a commercial retail zone. And those are greater setbacks than a commercial zone. So if that's one reason why somebody who just wanted to do some kind of retail operation would be much more likely to just go with a commercial designation because there are harder standards to meet with this zone. Well, the difficulty of what you're saying is that it's easy to buy residential property in this market <laughs> as compared to buying commercial property. And residential property for the sizes that you're dealing with is very inexpensive, particularly in certain wards. And it's much less expensive to do that. So you can go out and buy the property. You can have your three acres in a heartbeat. Um, but I do have one question about. Um, well, well, Councilor, if I could just sure. just on that point, that's that's true. But under either scenario, a zone change to commercial retail, or it'd be a comprehensive plan and zone change to retail commercial, or a comprehensive plan and zone change to neighborhood center mixed use zone. Either way, would go through the same process, and ultimately the council would have to be comfortable with that change before it could happen. Well, regardless, um, I, I don't think you're getting my drift on what I said, but that's fine. With regard to properties, with regard to setbacks, no. Lot line adjustments. 
in the residential areas, can you have a lot line adjustment without going through a process just by designation, such as you can do for commercial property? You can get a property line adjustment. Uh, it, there is a process for it, but... Uh, well, for example, in commercial, if you have two lots and you own both parcels, you can have a lot line adjustment so that you have a larger square without going through any process of the city other than to give notice. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. Can, can you do that with residential? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So a person who could go out and buy a large chunk of real estate, uh, which are contiguous, can just mm -hmm. automatically mm -hmm. end up with a larger parcel. Mm -hmm. okay. True. That's what they do. Thank you very much. Councillor Nanke. Thank you, President Bennett. Um, major intersection. Basically, it's anything minor arterial and up for one leg and collector and up from the other. Is Columbia a collector or a neighborhood street? It's a local street. Okay, so no one could put one there because <laughs> it's not within an eighth of a mile of a major intersection. Right. right. Well, I think that's true. Okay, probably. Potentially. Yeah. Um, with but they could get that property zone commercial, as we know. Right. Right. Portland Road, Silverton Road, that's not a major intersection? Not within an eighth of a mile, is it? Yeah, the question would be, is, yeah. is Columbia Street within an eighth of a mile of that intersection? <laughs> that's, that was the hesitation. So. It's close. Yeah. But uh, it just... People were throwing you don't have three acres like, there. Yeah, please do that. <laughs> All right, which is the, the other criteria is that's yeah. that's a fraction of an acre, right? You know, unless you started buying houses. And hence my next question: Can you give a couple of examples in and around a couple of these intersections? Maybe they're commercial or maybe they're not. That lay out three acres and fifteen, so people can actually visualize how much of an intersection you would need on a corner to we can, actually be we able can to try. Of these. We can try. I mean, even if it's just something that people mm -hmm. can recognize as, yeah. say, the size yeah. of a park yeah. um, that maybe hits that, because then they can kind of visualize all the edges of that. Clark Creek Park is three. Okay, great. Any further questions? Um, yes, if I would. Okay. We talked about a neighborhood association not necessarily agreeing with all four corners of an intersection. If someone... What is the criteria that would allow a neighborhood association to say, no, I don't want it on all four corners and be successful? It would be whether or not they could convince you as their elected representatives to vote it down. Based on what criteria, or would we not be bound to criteria and findings? No, it, it is a you discretionary decision. Okay. The, it, the, the burden so would have is on to have the, no findings. Well, you have to have findings. The burden <laughs> will be on the applicant to prove that the proposal meets the criteria the criteria and the standards contained in the ordinance. But that decision of whether to approve the, first the zone change and secondly the master plan is a um, discretionary decision of the planning commission that's reviewable and therefore uh, the council could render the final decision. You could deny a proposal if you didn't find that it met the criteria. Like but any other What criteria zone. would we not be able to find necessarily? Well, that would depend on the, the specifics of the proposal. You, you, you nice to have some kind of an example of where somebody wanted to do something. Just an example of any criteria that wasn't able to be met from a discretionary perspective. We, we can bring you what, what you the criteria or the criteria that you evaluate whenever you change zoning, the conference of plan and the zoning, we can bring you those criteria so that will be clear yeah, to you. Yeah, just to, because that one's weird. Okay. Um, or as my son would say, gooey. Um, I'll see if I can that, get you, I'll see if I can get you some criteria there, Councillor. Excellent, because I know there's been several, but uh, basically saying that a neighborhood association wouldn't allow it, but um, that, as long yeah. as they meet the criteria and we can't find a hole in the criteria, then uh, we have to approve it, correct? Well, I, I think we can't find a finding that says they don't meet it. A comp plan change and a zone change are very uh, broad criteria. I believe one of them is that it's in the public interest. So you have, it's hard, um, you have a broad range that you can choose from when it comes to those. And I'll bet that Mr. Tosh is about to quote those to you. Well, I, I know in the past, 
you know, ten and a half years, there have been some criteria that we've said, oh, I don't think it meets this, and it was like, you got to be kidding me. Um, yeah, that happens. And then it starts getting into that, depending on who's sitting in these chairs, yeah, you can have it or no, That's you right. can't. That's right. Which is, just bites the equity uh, bone to me. But that's the way that comprehensive plan and zone changes work in a community. Well, you, have, you have legislative zone changes and you have quasi-judicial zone changes. This will most likely be quasi-judicial in nature because it's going to be one discrete piece of property. So your criteria would include um, the existence of a mistake in the comp compilation of any map or in the application of land use designation of the property, a change in the social, economic, demographic patterns in the neighborhood or the community, a change in the conditions of the, in the character of the neighborhood, the effect of the proposal on the neighborhood, the physical characteristics of the subject, subject property and public facilities and services, and any other factor that relates to the public's health, health, safety, and general welfare that the review authority identifies as relevant to the proposed change. Okay. So yeah, you I have, remember a couple of those. They're broad. <laughs> <laughs> they're Easier broad. said than done, though. And, and yes. the, the, we've, we have, in the process of working on the UDC, we have worked on these criteria and tried to make them um, um, a, a bit more, I don't, I don't want to say concrete, but a bit more conceptually coherent than they are now. Right, because I know we've actually had some issues with some of those. Well, the neighborhood is turning more medical office yes, in this way, but it's, you know, half a mile away. But yeah, this is kind of in that area, so mm -hmm. how about we, we go ahead and let mm -hmm. you do that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Clem, do you have a motion? Yes, I do. Um, I, at first, I would offer that uh, I can name five or six land use decisions that council has developed findings that it wasn't mm -hmm. in, in, consistent with the character of the neighborhood. So I, I, I appreciate uh, comments that have been made, but, but quite frankly, uh, I can cite five right off the top of my head to include the property across the street. Uh, wherein the variance uh, distance wasn't enough on, it was enough on Orchard Heights, wasn't enough on Dokes Ferry, or the other way around. And so developing findings for uh, what council determines has, has never been a struggle for us. We've always been able to do that. But um, uh, Mr. President, I would move that uh, we hold the public hearing open until the second meeting in August and receive written comments as well as answers back to staff not later than one week before the closing Sorry. of that public hearing so that the public has a chance to see that information. Second. Okay. Second by that? Tesler. Vicki? May I make a suggestion? Um, that timing is difficult for us as staff. Um, Mr. Gross won't be here on the 22nd. Could we do that at the first meeting in September, rather? Ooh. Um, I would amend my motion to the first meeting in September. Second degree. Yes. And, and just, just to be clear, what, what your motion would do, yeah. Councilor Clem, is that uh, after a week before the hearing, there would be no additional written testimony that would be taken, but at the hearing, there would be additional oral testimony taken. That's correct. Okay. That is a holiday, I believe. What would we be meeting the next Tuesday? It's Tuesday. So we meet the second and fourth second Mondays in September, just second night. I, I believe the actually we meet the following So it would day. be the, the first meeting would be 12th. the 12th uh -huh. of and that's September. that's not the holiday. Right. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it's not the holiday. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Nanke. Yeah, there was a, a list of items that the West Salem Neighborhood Association had wanted to see modified in that. Is it possible then for staff to... <laughs> at least evaluate some of those and see if those could be incorporated. I would leave that to a counselor from said ward since he probably knows what I'll, the content uh, of those are more so. I'll confirm with staff because I believe that my four questions were the four basic points, but I'll, I'll confirm that all? okay. that's addressed. And available for the public to see a week prior to the public hearing, or continuance of the public. Any further comments or questions? Councilor Kloss. I'll try to keep this quick, Mr. President. Um, a counselor Nanke made a question when he was talking about Columbia that I'm curious about. The ordinance reads that a district should not be located within one eighth of a mile of a major intersection, which implies that the intent is that it's on the intersection streets. But I don't see any clarification of what if you have a street that's kitty corner and it doesn't even lie on those streets or a piece of property. So is it an eighth of a mile radius or is it an eighth of a mile along the streets? And is that cutting hairs? 
Yeah. Well, it's an eighth of a mile from the intersection, and presumably the property would be fronting on one of the streets. Why don't we do this with that question? That will be part of your responses yeah. to us. Yeah, totally fine. Then the okay. answer to that. Great. Just yeah. something to think about. Because well. this has been somewhat unclear. I'll give you a chance to really take okay. a look yeah. at it. Okay. On the motion. Um, just as far as a potential additional, does that count a, uh, say, commercial where it splits into Liberty and commercial? Is that an intersection? Yeah. We can define what we mean by yeah. intersection. Yeah. We'll come back with that. Good. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay. I will move to second readings. First reading. First, first readings. Is that where we are? Yeah. There we are. First readings. 9B, though. 9B. Yeah. That would be Who reads these? Yeah. You want to read those? You bet. We're going to go with. Um, 9.1B because 9.1A was moved to information reports. Yes. Ordinance Bill number 2511 approving a major amendment to the West Salem Urban Renewal Plan. Actually, would you care for me to actually ask Councilor Clem for words? Yeah, yeah. Councilor Clem. A move staff recommendation. Second. Second. Any questions? Comments? Who, who was the second? In, who did? I was. Okay. Uh, Andy. Sorry. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion passes. Next ordinance. Ordinance Bill number 2611 relating to property maintenance, community development standards, and parking, amending SRC 50.025, 265, 840, 240, 59.045, and 102.155, and declaring an emergency. Councilor Nanke. Mr. I move staff recommendation. Second. Been moved, seconded by Councillor Cannon, moved by Nanke. Any questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes to second reading. Uh, next one. Ordinance Bill Number 2711, assessing property located at 3737 Croizen Creek Road South for connection to an existing water line, making provision therefore and declaring an emergency. Move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Nanke. Comments, questions, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Ordinance Bill Number 2811, assessing property located at 3737 Croizen Creek Road South for connection to an existing sewer line, making provision therefore and declaring an emergency. Councilor Cannon. Move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Nanke. Any questions, comments? Just a, just a comment. I just want to tell everyone that one uh, D relates to the prior year. This The next one relates to the upcoming year. Thank you. There you go. Mr. Fernandez, do you agree? I'm sorry. It's it's <laughs> Councilor, just, uh, just to clarify, D relates to water and E relates to sewer. Same address, two different? Two different years. Well, it's two different two different utilities. Yeah, right. They're making two different connections. All right. They're making a water connection and a sewer connection. So it's I time and right. utility or just utility and <laughs> utility? <laughs> well, we, we never want to confuse the two. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it passes. Move to second readings. Ordinance Bill Number 2311, providing for and assessing for an existing sewer line against benefited property located at 4704 Niles Avenue, Northeast, City of Salem, Oregon, directing the Director of Finance to enter such assessment in the lien docket of the City of Salem, directing the service of notice of said assessment upon the owner of said property and declaring an emergency. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey is absent. Councillor Thomas is absent. Councillor Cannon? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. And Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill Number 2411, providing for and assessing for an existing sewer line against benefited property located at 6078 Sunnyside Road, Southeast, City of Salem, Oregon, directing the Director of Finance to enter such assessment in the lien docket of the City of Salem, directing the service of notice of said assessment upon the owner of said property and declaring an emergency. Councillor Bennett? 
Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey is absent. Councillor Thomas is absent. Councillor Cannon? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. All right. Great. Thank you. I have three people signed up for public comment. Ted Campbell. Once again, my name is Ted Campbell, and I'm, this time I'm representing the members of AFP in Marion and Polk County in the city limits. That's about 700 people. Uh, I promise one of these days I won't be complaining when I come here. <laughs> but as a citizen of the United States of America and the state of Oregon, I'm outraged and insulted by the city of Salem's flying of the UN flag in front of the city hall. I realize the flag is in front of a peace memorial, but the UN does not relate to peace. The United Nations exists solely because there are conflicts in the world. These prime resources, that is their prime resource for money, is peacekeeping. They promote conflict so that they can employ people for peacekeeping and keep their status as the United Nations. If the United Nations truly wanted to keep peace in the world, they would not send troops to these places and then only allow the troops to support the people who pay the most money the, to the United Nations. They would send troops there to stop the fight. The city of Salem, by flying the UN flag is in front of the city hall, is supporting the most corrupt organization in the history of the United States and the world. There are 192 member states in the United Nations, and the United States pays approximately 25% of the operating cost of the United Nations. It should be divided equally among the 192 states, and we'd only be paying 0.58% of the operating cost and not in the, no, the paper I gave you, 22% of the operating cost of the military on top of this is from the United States. And when we send peacekeeping troops there at Blue Helmets from the United States, we still pay their wages, so with that 22% is going to foreign countries. The original intent of the United Nations was good, but it has become a bucket that we throw money into, just like a lot of other organizations that we do. A one world organization is what they want to be. They want to rule the world. They want one money. Uh, everything you've said here tonight about sustainability goes back to the United Nations, but they're going to talk about that in a minute. By flying the flag in front of City Hall, you insult all service personnel that have served in the armed forces of the United States to help keep peace in the world. The UN stands by and watches our people die while they get rich. They think they are untouchable. They do what they want, when they want, and thumb their noses at the people of the United States. They are jealous of the United States because we seem to be able to do anything we set our minds to. I am writing this as a military veteran and a concerned citizen. I also intend to forward this to the newspapers and that not, that's not a threat. Just people need to know what's going on. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Campbell? Councillor Clamp. Just staff, um, Linda, the council ran into, has come up with this a couple of times. There was a gentleman who wanted to have the Transcendental Meditation flag flown in Peace Plaza. It seemed to me that council created a, or gave the authority for what flags, what displays are allowed in Peace Plaza to some It's the Peace Plaza committee. committee. Okay. Yeah. And um, they do, I was talking to Mr. Campbell earlier, they um, have decided which flags would be there, and those are the ones uh, that have been flown there, but I can bring more information back to council so that everyone has that background information. Yeah, I, th I, th I think just the information will be helpful, but sure. I'm concerned that Mr. Campbell's request gets routed to right. that that group of folks and then council can do what it wants Cer after that. But they should have a chance to consider his request. Uh, the, the, the peacekeeping of, of 2011 is a whole lot different than what it was even four years ago once we, when we uh, first, I think, formed that committee. It so, may have even been longer ago than that. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I think uh, it, it's a good question for them to consider and for us to know what their decision was. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Laura Million? Can I follow up on that one quick? Sure. Um, You're still up next, Laura. Just in, in regards to, will this actually be forwarded to them? Does that require a council motion? And can we get the uh, the information on who would actually look at it and be kept abreast of its process as it moves through? This matter actually came to the council um, about uh, six years ago. It was referred to a subcommittee that was comprised of uh, Councilor DeHart, uh, Councilor Sullivan, and I believe at that point it was Councilor 
oh, they leave and I forget their names. Um, Anna Brown? No, no, Stuckey, Councilor Stuckey. And um, they considered the matter and uh, uh, made a recommendation back to the council to uh, continue flying the flag. The council voted on it and voted to continue flying the flag. So this has been to the council within the last uh, six years or so. It would be nice to just see that report again. Yes, we could bring that back to you. And, and then if council wants to direct that this be reconsidered, you can make that decision then. Excellent. Okay. Any further questions, comments? Laura. Thank you, council. Uh, my name is Laura Million, and I live in Ward 2, uh, Mrs. Tesler's ward. Miss. Miss, oh, Miss <laughs> Tesler's ward. Um, some time ago, I wrote to council suggesting that the Seaport Venture was not a good investment of my tax dollars because of the fact that we live only 45 minutes away from the Portland International Airport. I did not feel that there was a strong enough customer base to support this venture. My concerns became reality after only three months. With rent abatement dried up and our $10,000 gone, Seaport has announced their decision to close their doors. I understand that Seaport has gone onto greener pastures and closed a deal with the state to be an official carrier. It's curious that the Seaport owner is a former lobbyist and Salem Airport Advisory Commission Chairman Tim Hay also works for the State of Oregon Department of Administrative Services in the Contracts Department. I wonder if there is any connection. And as, I'm, and as I'm sure you're aware, the Statesman Journal has run several articles about this debacle, but what caught my eye were individuals commenting on those articles, raising some very serious concerns beyond just a failed venture. I did a little investigative digging and understand that a Chapter 13 FAA complaint was filed against the city for failure to ensure that individuals and businesses operating at the airport are properly licensed and carry the appropriate liability insurance, a violation of the city's own code. I further understand that the FAA is investigating allegations that former airport administrator Alan Alexander possibly lied in his response to the Chapter 13 FAA complaint filed about the licenses and insurance issues. The city has a legal and a fiduciary duty to be good stewards of the public's resources and funds. So I'm asking city council to open up an investigation into the possible misuse of our tax dollars, as well as direct city staff to audit all license and insurance records for those operating at the airport. I'm also asking city to put the kibosh on the EIR report to extend the airport runway because it would serve no purpose except unless the intent is to try to bring yet another airline into Salem. The citizens have spoken and the market has spoken twice now. It is time to stop. Thanks. Any questions, Laura? So I, I, thanks for coming down, by the way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious if you have been to an airport advisory commission meeting and told them your feelings. Not yet. I just found out about this stuff last week. And I would highly yeah. suggest you attend one of their meetings and let them know how you feel. Um, maybe even just tell them exactly what you told us tonight. Um, I think that would be refreshing okay. for them to hear your perspective. Um, I, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of moving parts in this picture. Um, I didn't have the privilege of reading that article in the paper. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you to attend one of those meetings okay. um, and share your opinion with them. Very well. So those, that would be my suggestion to you. Okay. Uh, Vicki, could you, could you uh, explain the status of the $10,000 that uh, yeah. Seaport received? Um, Vicki was in charge of this before we reorganized the city. So, uh, Somebody wasn't said the I 10, can talk to I knew Not about. yours. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, the airport is now in the Urban Development Department. We brought a staff report to council um, at the beginning of the time when, where we also had the licensing agreements to waive the landing fees. And uh, at that time, it also asked for approval to spend 10000 of some funds that were budgeted for economic development. 
department to do the marketing, uh, start some initial marketing for Seaport Airlines, and that money was expended. It was approved by City Council and was expended. Is there any, uh, are, do they have to pay it back? There's no requirement that they pay that back. We're in discussions with Seaport, though. Okay. On that issue. Yeah, because I, I was mistaken, and someone had emailed. I'd emailed them back saying that that ten thousand, because they didn't stay here six months, uh, they would be required to reimburse us of that. That was my. Um, I found out on my walk across the way, um, from getting my mail to the work session, that that in fact uh, was not the case. But there are still some funds, the landing fees that were waived that um, council, possibly we can try to get reimbursement for? Well, council, I'm sure, recalls that we waived uh, those fees for a six-month period. I'm sorry, I don't have that number right in the top of my head, but it's a fairly low number, a few hundred dollars a month. Um, we, uh, I would just like to say at this point, I think that we're in negotiations with Seaport regarding those. Okay, thanks. Any other? Councilor <laughs> I would be curious about the $10,000 issue. I, I, for a third now, was under the impression that if they didn't stay six months, that $10,000 was not the city's responsibility. No, um, in the staff report, we just asked for approval to expend the $10,000 for marketing. It wasn't tied to an agreement with Seaport. The staff report is um, available on our website. else. Laura, thank you very much. You make a very good point. Thank you stay a week. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ray, you're up. I'm the last one. So you are in. Everybody stay awake five minutes longer. My name is Ray Arana. I'm uh, a resident of Salem and proud to be a resident of Salem for the last 28 years. I've enjoyed this community a great deal. I have, for the last year and a half, worked in the refugee camps, can you hear me? In the refugee camps in Haiti. I came home specifically to talk to you this evening about Agenda 21. Perhaps you've heard about it, perhaps you haven't. I have documents that are being passed out right now to give you a general overview of what it's about and what it's doing to our communities all over the United States. We're against it. I'm a member of AFP, but I'm not here as a Republican. I'm not here as a Democrat. I'm here as a citizen of the United States. Sustainable development out of, that, that is out of hand is, going, is designed by Agenda 21 to take our liberty away. What they want to do, if you take a look at the map on the front page, and this is just, this is just a brief, what the game plan is, is to all the areas, in, for the most part, in orange and red, that's for the animals. All the little black spots, that's for the people. I don't see any black spots. I know, you gotta look real close to find the black spots, don't you? But the game plan is, you know, that's that's their ultimate game plan. I've got a couple of paragraphs I'd just like to read into the record if, if you'll let me let me locate them here. By the way, for a year and a half I've I've lived under the thumb of the United Nations and it was it's really it's really an amazing experience. Well, you know, I've seen people, you know, do you want to hear it? I've lived there. You do you have time minutes. for it? Ray, you're getting, you're getting Okay, out sustainable time. development is a plan for global control, including the restriction of land use and resource extraction. The land use element of sustainable development calls for the implementation of two action plans designed to abolish private property, the wetlands network and smart growth. Upon final implementation of these plans, all human action is subject to control. It's all in Agenda 21. We're doing research right now. We're going to bring more information to you in the future. We want you to be aware. That's why we came here this evening. Great. You have 30 more seconds if you have anything on that. Uh, I'll leave that open for questions if you have any. I, you know, I could go through the whole thing. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's going to affect all of us if we don't do something about it. And you guys are the ones that are, you're, you're the point persons. You're the speak, you're the ones that represent us. And we want you to be aware of what we're aware of and becoming more aware of on a, on a daily basis. Any questions? That, that do it? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much for coming down Thank and talking you. to us about this. It's a very interesting topic. Okay.
Uh, new business, have a mayor's item. Let's see. I move the city council establish an entertainment district committee to consider best practices, possible locations, and other options for possible entertainment district in Salem. Second. Uh, I believe you all have received a copy of the uh, information uh, supplied by the mayor in advance of this. Uh, it's mainly to put together a committee be comprised, uh, she reports, of Laura Tesler, Cheryl Thomas, and Dan Clem to work on this issue. Okay. I'll vote for anything that doesn't have me on it. That's kind of how I <laughs> Okay. Any, any uh, questions, comments? Have we got enough here to do this? I think we do. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> Item 11.2. I have a motion. I move that the mayor, on behalf of the city of Salem, be authorized by city council to send letters of support for grant applications for the biodiesel bus acquisition project and regional transit center development project being submitted by the Salem Area Mass Transit District. Again, you have received information on this, uh, and uh, this would allow the mayor to support this grant application. Any questions or concerns? Uh, do you want to second this thing? Second. Clausen seconded it. Thank Good catch. <laughs> I was reading. You were waiting. Were you? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Is there any further business? If not, uh, we got an executive session. We're going to adjourn into executive session. <laughs>